Benoit, once uh, Charlie is in, maybe we can make a round of quick introductions because not everyone knows, uh, yeah, as opposed to the shaking of hands in uh, presidential defense. And Charlie is here. Yeah, you are. Hello, everybody. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Hello. Okay. Uh... I think since we are all here, uh, we can indeed uh, start with a short introduction uh, that everyone can uh, tell in a few words who he is. So we'll start in the uh, order similar to the one we will do for the questions uh, later on. So maybe uh, we can start with uh, the two referees, so Patrice Bello. Uh, yes, yeah. okay, <laughs> thank you, Benoit. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so I am Patrice Bello. And I am professor in natural language processing, uh, information retrieval in the Ex Marseille University. Okay, thank you. And then that's Ruth et Costa. You should turn out none, none the sound. Voila. Okay, so very nice to meet all of you. Uh, so I'm Ruth Costa from the New University of Lisbon. I'm a linguist and I have a PhD in lexicography and terminology. Okay, thank you. Then we will uh, move to the examiners. Uh, so there is Thomas. Hi, my name is Thomas Tasselitz. I'm the director of the Belgrade Center for Digital Humanities and also one of the three directors of DARIA EU. Um, and in my own scholarly work, I, I work on dictionaries on um, data modeling, um, TI, digital editions, and things like that. Thank you. Then there is Charlie. Uh, uh, I'm Karl-Heinz Mert from the Austrian Academy of Sciences. I'm director uh, of the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage. My academic background is actually uh, Arabic studies, Arabic and Near Eastern languages. And uh, I've been working for a long time in the uh, field of lexicography, also doing dictionaries myself. Thank you. Then there is Patrice. I think it's me, no? Yes, it is you. Patrice, Patrice Lopez, I mean, yes, sure. of course. Right? I'm, uh, Patrice Lopez. Uh, so I basically, I'm, uh, I have a PhD in uh, NLP, so I'm a uh, computer scientist. I'm uh, specialized in uh, machine learning, and I'm the developer of Grobid. And that's it. Thank you, Patrice. The next one is Laurent, so that's the director. Hi, everyone. So I'm uh, Laurent Romary. I'm researcher at INRIA in computer science and uh, Mohamed's supervisor. OK, and the last one, that's me. Uh, I'm the president of the jury. And so I'm Benoit Crabé, and I'm professor of natural language processing at the University of Paris. Uh, and my speciality is machine learning and uh, structure prediction. Uh, and before starting the, the defense, I would like to recall that uh, you, in case you, you are uncomfortable for speaking in English, you may speak in French uh, for French speakers, but uh, we will try to avoid uh, in order that Thomas can uh, get the whole content. But really, if you are in difficulty, you can uh, turn on the French. Uh, and so once we are all, uh, we, we, uh, we can, in fact, start the, the defense. So the, the, that's from uh, Mohamed now. And uh, you have uh, approximately 40 minutes to do your talk. Then the talk will be followed by a round of questions of the, by the members of the jury. So thank you, you can start when you want. Great, thanks a lot. Um, I still didn't introduce myself. My name is Mohamed Khmerim, uh, Mohamed Khmerim, when you pronounce it in French. Um, I am a PhD candidate. Uh, I've done my research work um, at INRIA de Paris and um, Université de Paris, uh, Paris Diderot more specifically. And, um, Today, we are going to talk about dictionaries and more specifically how to build models to automatically parse them to generate standardized lexical resources. Um, 
So um, dictionaries are um, a reservoir of human knowledge. Anatole France considered them as the whole universe in alphabetical order. We are interested in print dictionaries, which are the backbone for many natural language processing applications, such as material is important not only for less resource languages, but it's also important for well-supported languages um, to complete and enrich them um, with uh, more information. Moreover, um, humanists nowadays are thirsty for efficient ways to automatically extract information from dictionaries to study the evolution of human language, knowledge, and civilization. Um, dictionary could be categorized from many perspectives. They can be semasiological, where a word is represented by its possible meanings. They can also be onomasiological, and this is when a concept is represented by a set of synonym words. There are also monolingual, bilingual, and multilingual dictionaries. A dictionary could be modern, but it could be also legacy, one that has been compiled decades or centuries ago. Consequently, analyzing their lexical structures can get harder for machines and sometimes for humans because of the poor textual, textual and typographic clues they contain. Print dictionaries in electronic formats can be born digi digitally using dedicated tools, um, like the monolingual dictionary that we see here on the left of the slide, um, and the multilingual one on the right. Um, such documents um, usually have good quality of text and typography, but dictionaries in their digital version, even the modern ones, could be compiled from a paper version using an optical character uh, recognition system. The quality of these digitized dictionaries varies a lot depending on the digitization process. And in fact, um, it's very often to have noise in the text of type um, and uh, a loss of typographic information in these resources. So in this work, we are interested in structuring all these dictionaries as long as they fall in the semasiological category. Let's see now how structuring dictionaries actually works. So parsing print dictionaries is the task of assigning labels to sequences of text representing lexical constructs. This labeling task is done for multi-levels as a token in a text sequence extracted from a dictionary plays different roles in representing a lexical structure. For instance, the first token of the example we see here represents the lemma but it also represents, um, it belongs actually to a form and an entry in a body part of a page dictionary and a dictionary page, sorry. Um, and we were surprised by how re relatively primitive are the existing approaches um, and employed techniques. In fact, um, many rule-based are still popular and only few works were based on machine learning mainly hidden Markov models and uh, conditional random fields. These graphical models showed good results. Um, CRF in particular have shown a stronger ability to represent a token in a sequence. But both were used to parse shadow structures in relatively simple dictionaries with entries not exceeding a few lines, like the samples we see here on the right of the slide. For these, for the three most relevant works using machine learning, the researchers had to create their own structured data from target dictionaries to be able to train their models. So let's see now what's wrong with the existing structured lexical resources. So most of the available structured dictionaries come from Wikipedia, Wiktionary, and ad hoc digitization projects. We have noticed for the existing resources, especially for the case of retro digitized um, dictionaries, that the structured versions are cleaned from the noise coming from the original texts. This represents a serious bottleneck for training a machine learning model to structure real world data, as it cannot learn how to process and label such a non-lexical text. Um,
just a sec. Um, and there is a plenty of um, heterogeneous, sorry, um, that was a slide before. Sorry. And um, most of, um, second, no. Sorry. I think I skipped the slide. Yeah, that's what. Um, sorry. So there is a lot, so plenty of heterogeneous formats and standards um, used for um, such resources, like TI, which stands for um, Text Encoding Initiative. LMF, which stands for Lexical Markup Framework, which is an ISO standard. Um, to our knowledge, until 2016, uh, there has been no concrete strategy to create interoperable um, lexical resources on a, on a large scale. We see here an illustration of the issue within the same standard, TI, for example. We can take the example of structuring the Dictionary Arti uh, Article Act, which contains homographs with different parts of speech. As we can see, two TI modelings are possible. Um, one, the one on on the left, each homograph is encoded as um, an entry. On the right, we see them encoded as senses within the, the same entry. We can imagine now how these differences could be further amplified for more granular information and for other lexical standards using different modeling approaches. We found ourselves in a chicken egg problem where experimenting advanced machine learning techniques like neural networks is blocked by the lack of suitable data. The data in its turn couldn't be generated in a substan substantial amount using non-scalable techniques. We suspect that this issue is behind the, lex the imbalanced lexical, uh, lexicographic landscape where a large amount of digitized documents is continuously made available but now advanced techniques could be employed to parse these documents. So um, standards ironically were parts of the problem of non-converging schemes. TI, as we have seen for the homographs example, suffers from this issue because it's too flexible. By the time we started this project, TI Lex Zero, which is an initiative to unify modeling practices, started getting concrete in the context of a special interest group within Daria and later the Alexis project. In parallel, LMF has been under revision to come up with a more flexible modeling and to connect with TI, which is considered the de facto standard for lexical resources. Ontolex Lemon is a third standard which is used for encoding lexical resources for the semantic web. It could be considered as the shadow of TI and LMF um, and the gate to the, of these um, two standards to, um, to the linked open uh, world data. Therefore, we remained focused on this work on TILX0 and LMF for the development of our approach while synchronizing in a second time with web semantic experts, namely our colleague uh, Fahad Khan uh, from Alexis. Our goals uh, in, this, in this thesis were to find first an approach for parsing multi-layers of lexical information in print dictionaries without being tied to any sample. And the second aim was to contribute to the recent initiatives and make sure our sterilization remain in line with them. The third goal was to guarantee the scalability of our lexical models. To develop our approach, we started investigating what we already have um, in-house. So we found a powerful infrastructure called Grobit, which has been designed to parse scientific papers. Few people know that this tool is behind the success of many projects and commercial companies like HAL and ResearchGate. The main features that caught our attention in Grobit are um, the fact that it offers powerful utilities to process digital documents. It is constantly evolving and well-maintained platform. And most importantly, um, it was designed for cascading parsing by means of machine learning models. Um, besides these points, we also observed the strong analogy with the constructs of the information at certain levels. We can take, for instance, the structure of bibliographic references and dictionary articles. 
So as we can see here, the transitions between the fields are marked by a consist consistent change in the typographic features, like we see uh, here, uh, the italic and the font change, and textual markers, like the parentheses, the slashes, the dots. This analogy is reinforced by the fact that Grobit actually relies on these features to perform the labeling of such text sequences. Given these similarities, we try to simulate the waterfall parsing of papers for extracting lexical information. So let's assume we have this dictionary page. Um, as a first model, we can imagine a parser that isolates the body part um, from the head notes and the footnotes. In a second stage, another parser will analyze the body structure to find the boundaries of the entries. In a third stage, a model will get each entry as an input and identifies the morphological and grammatical information, as we can see here in green, the etymology in blue, and the senses in red. The same logic goes on and on till reaching the finest lexical structures. And this is how Grobit Dictionary's project started. To develop our approach, we started by building the architecture, then we shaped the serialization of the models by synchronizing with the recent standardization initiatives. And we had to constantly um, test these models with real world data and taking into account the feedback from domain users. Um, we had carrying out these steps had to be iterative as we had to take into consideration the limitations at each stage and adapt that in our approach. After stabilizing the architecture, we studied different ways for scaling up our approach. Um, to design the models, we fo followed the, logical and uh, the logic and technology uh, used in Grobit by having a limited number of labels to predict at each level. We also relied on YPT models, um, which are an implementation of conditional random fields. We had to make sure our models are flexible enough to support a large variety of dictionaries. Therefore, um, several models are pluggable at many levels to parse the same category of information as the logical structure of lexical entry can, entries can vary from one dictionary to another, and sometimes even within the same dictionary. For instance, the grammatical um, group information, uh, the grammatical group model, what we see here in green, can be plugged to parse the output of the lexical entry, sense, subsense, and form models. Same for the lexical entry model, what we see here in dark blue, which could be used to parse the entries and also sub-entries and related entries. To fine tune these models, we used features based on the text, layout, and typography, which we extract from the descriptive matrix we see here. Each line in this matrix corresponds to the description of a token in a dictionary article. As text features, we used, for instance, neighboring tokens and field separators. We tried to abstract over punctuation, for example, by having a unique flag for commas, dots, and semicolons. We also used one flag for opening of parentheses and different categories of brackets, like square brackets, um, round brackets. And um, as layout and typography features, we used flags to detect line breaks, font change, italic, and so on and so forth. The second variable we played on um, was the feature templates, where we used three variations, unigram and bigram templates. The difference between these two is that the bigram ones, um, the model in this case takes the label of the previous token into consideration to predict the current label where for the unigram templates, this option is disabled. The third category of templates is a variation of the bigram ones, where we enlarge the bidirectional window of information about the neighboring tokens, which we see here on the left side of the descriptive matrix. To activate a model, we follow the matter workflow as described by Pustyovsky and Stubbs, after defining the models, we need 
to annotate, test, um, evaluate. Then a revision is required to decide if we need to go through another iteration or we should stop. And to concretize the pluggable aspect of the parsers, we implemented them as RESTful services. The architecture and its design are further described in our ELEX conference publications of uh, 2017 and 2019. We move on now to the second milestone, which is about defining the TI encoding of our lexical models. So as we have, as we have briefly seen, um, we have on the one hand, the TLX0, which came um, to present recommendations for TI encoding practices. On the other hand, the recent LMF revision has the goal to come up with modular lexicon design and wider scope than the version of 2008. We had the chance to start this project at the kickoff of um, these two initiatives. On the TILX0 side, my role was to verify that TI modeling is suitable for automatic extraction. On the LMF side, um, my task within the ISO working group was to ensure the consistency of the core models while thinking and making their serialization converging with TILX0. Here is a, an example. Um, just a second, sorry. Here is an example of our contribution to TLX0. It's actually about the punctuation that is used by lexicographers as a field separator. Marking up the, the transition between the fields is very important for the sequence labor. Um, this was actually conferred by Patrice Lopez, who had a lot of experience by annotating um, data for CRF models. But the issue back then was uh, that entry model in the TI guidelines did not allow having the PC elements. Bringing this point to the discussion helped the group to find out that such information can be isolated from the parent element, form in this case, and as a consequence, marking up this, these separators with a proper PC is healthier for both the serialization and the parser. Let's get now to a major revision we carried out to lighten the LMF meta model. It's about the pointing mechanism that had been used in uh, the 2008 version. There, are, there were different ways to link entries and most annoying one um, was used for representing multi-word expressions um, that we can see here in the diagram on the left. In the new version of LMF, three objects, one list of components and two components got replaced by one object called crossref. Moreover, um, the crossref class is generalized now over the whole meta model to unify all pointing mechanisms. This simplification was easier to translate afterwards in the TI serialization, as we can see here in the encoding on the left. This work led to two publications we had with colleagues from Parthenos and working group four of ISO TC 37 SE4. For the final serialization, the major challenges we found were related to the fact that the two standards follow different uh, modeling approaches. TILX0 is actually more print version driven, where LMF is more database oriented standard. We translated the design of the models into TI elements, firstly by staying compliant to the TI specifications, and secondly, by synchronizing when it's possible with TILX0 and LMF. Let's see now how we manage to test our standardized models. We had the great opportunity to expose our system to users from different backgrounds by organizing a series of hands-on sessions um, that we called Global Dictionaries Workshops. We needed to find a way to make the system more usable, especially by users with limited IT skills. The first thing we did was actually to wrap up a ready-to-use version um, of the tool in a Docker image that could be quickly installed on the user's machine. The second heavy aspect of the environment was the multi-level annotation, which is necessary to train the machine learning models. Um, through some workarounds, we managed to create a user-friendly annotation environment based on Oxygen's author mode, as we can see here in the figure on the right of the slide. 
As a result, we managed to organize over 15 workshops and get over 100 participants familiar with the system. Thanks to the enhanced usability, we managed to test the applicability of our models on samples from almost all dictionaries brought to the workshops. In this table, we can see the pool of dictionaries we had for just the first workshop we had back in 2017. Such a recurrent exercise helped us to early spot our and approach several weaknesses of our models and fix them. One paper we published with our colleague Axel from the Academy of Sciences in Berlin gives more details about the usability of cropped dictionaries. After the back and forth to stabilize the models, we wanted to test the ability of the architecture to scale up. For that, we carried out several experiments to observe the behavior of the models on a larger scale. Our experimental goals were actually to study for each model the impact of feature engineering, learning curve, and the generalizing capacity of each model. For that, we have designed three experiments for seven models of the architecture. For the first series of experiments, we trained all the models using one sample. For the second, we trained each model with multiple samples. And to answer the question, Will Grobit dictionaries be able to structure unseen dictionaries? Um, we carried out the third um, experiment series. The pool of the pool we used um, for these experiments contains five dictionaries, two monolingual samples, a modern English dictionary, and a digitized version of the popular French legacy dictionary Le Vitre, the example we see here in blue. And we also used three bilingual dictionaries, one Mishtek Spanish dictionary, the one in red. We worked on this, in, uh, on this dictionary, with this dictionary in the context of uh, collaboration with Jack Bowers, our fellow at the Academy of Sciences in Vienna. Mishtek, for people who don't know it, it's an endangered language spoken by a small community in South America. We used two more complex digitized samples, Funk French and French Funk dictionaries. Fong is, the, by the way, um, an African language spoken by around 1 million people in Central Africa. By semi-automatically annotating these samples, we have learned many things. First, we learned interesting things about different civilizations and the evolution of morals and knowledge. Second, we learned how hard is the sampling process since the selected pages have to be representative for different models and from different gran granularity levels. Another interfering factor with the already complex setup is the OCR impact, uh, especially for the case of retro-digitized samples. For that, we carried out a small experiment where we showed how different OCR qualities of the same pages of the same dictionary could lead to different machine learning performances. Let's get now to the results of the experiments. After the annotation has been carried out for seven models for the for the five dictionaries what we can observe here is that no magic feature templates can be used for all the models um, depending on the complexity of a model certain category of templates might be better than the others for instance um, the unigram templates despite being very simple they often outperform the more sophisticated templates when it comes to parsing simple structures in short sequences like grammatical group um, formation, for example. By analyzing the learning curve, we can observe several important aspects of the learning of our models. Depending on the complexity of each dictionary, the required number of page, pages is different. CRF models can tolerate noisy data coming from authorized samples. And CRF models can quickly reach a plateau. Combining samples works and actually helps avoiding overfitting, which means having a generic model trained with multiple samples is possible and it's even healthier. Now, um, can our models trained on some dictionaries parse unseen samples? The answer is not really or at least not with the little amount of data we have here. 
as we can see here in the results of the third experiment, the models are limited when it comes to parse and scene samples. This is somehow expected as our dictionary pool is very limited, which leaves the models with no clues to predict structures that were not seen during the training stage. And it's 2020. Uh, deep learning became nowadays the norm. So as you know, deep learning is very powerful when it comes to solving similar tasks, um, sequence labeling tasks, uh, tasks mainly, like um, part of speech tagging and named entity recognition. The main two differences with the task of labeling lexical structures is that there is a serious lack of um, usable data. And for certain levels, the task the, the text sequences are too long to be handled by the actual uh, deep learning architectures. For instance, in this dictionary, starting from the arrow on the first column and going beyond the nine columns we see here, Emilie Tre defines la lettre A. In another dictionary, La Grande Encyclopédie, um, the article France is described in 91 pages and the article Air, um, Air is more uh, in more than 50 pages. For this kind of legacy dictionaries, deep learning cannot be used for at least five models in our architecture. So after making sure that we have a stable, stable models and better understanding of um, the specificity of the data we are dealing with, we wanted to give deep learning a shot. Our choice to rely on Grobit did pay off at the end as several deep learning implementations were made easily to integrate, thanks to Patrice Lopez, of course, and uh, a library called Delft. We used the implementation of bidirectional uh, LSTM CRF model with globe embeddings, and we used the modern English dictionary of the first experiments to train five models starting from the lexical entry level. As we can see here, the performance of deep learning models in red not is not good as is not as good as the plain CRF models. This can be explained by the small amount of data we used for the training, which did not give the deep learning models enough material to abstract over. In the context of the Basnum project, we have already started looking deeper into this by generating more annotated data using um, Grobit dictionaries, and I think we will be able to see some concrete results in this direction sometime next year. So enough of um, dictionaries today. Let's change a bit the subject. Um, another aspect of the models we had the opportunity to study was actually the ability of our architecture to parse other documents with um, similar physical st structures. As we can see here, these two documents have very close layout and typography, which makes it hard from a first sight to tell which one is the dictionary and which one is the catalog. And thanks to the curiosity of one colleague from Neuchâtel, um, Simon Gabé, who attended the first Grobit Dictionaries workshop in Berlin, we had the idea of going beyond dictionaries um, with Grobit Dictionaries. We carried out experiments with dictionaries and catalogs, separated and mixed. And as you can see here, the five models we tested in yellow um, have very comparable results to those used to parse lexical material what we see here in pink. Even combining dictionaries and catalogs gives very comparable results to what we get when the two categories of documents are separated. These encouraging uh, results were the origin of having our colleagues at the University of Neuchâtel and Geneva using Groby dictionaries to build the structured database of legacy catalogs. And of course, they had to do some uh, work around to transform the TI output to match more adequate TI elements, uh, which are more suitable for catalog information. Last but not least, um, we had even more ideas of applying our models to address directories and bibliography collections. We actually have a collaboration within the time, the Paris Time Machine Consortium to parse legacy address directories in order to extract addresses and build something like Google Maps for Paris in the early 20th century. What we see here on the left is actually TI encoding of entries in these documents, which have good 
which gave good parsing results. But um, the project got stuck for a while because of the OCR quality we had. On the other side, uh, we carried out more experiments with other category of documents, like bibliography collections, um, where we combined models from Grobit and Grobit dictionaries. We had also a request to parse um, many other documents, like bank statements, um, but luckily we could say no. So, um, the details of some of the scaling up experiments you could find in our publications at the TI and the Japanese Digital Humanities Conferences. And to sum up this work, um, we could see that we first had fun during the last four years um, by solving multiple issues and finding new ones. And we believe that we managed to develop a methodology for building an end-to-end -end architecture that allows speeding up parsing of print dictionaries and, on, and other entry-based documents. Our approach is extensible in several directions, in particular for experimenting more abstract parsing. Um, our platform is also open source and could be usable to reproduce our experiments and designing new ones with new samples. And as you might have noticed, this, this thesis lies in the intersection of several fields um, in computer science and digital humanities. We think that we managed somehow to reduce the gap between machine learning and standardization, humanities and computational linguists, uh, linguistics, and um, connecting de facto and de jure st uh, standards. Um, there are also several issues that should be addressed to optimize our approach. For instance, making the models and their learning more dynamic, simplifying the chain of models and using, for example, meta learning are worth investigating, being investigated. And um, there are also some technical issues that need to be addressed, like supporting non-alphabetic languages like Japanese, for example, supporting Arabic dictionaries, where we still have an issue um, with the tokenization process. And dictionaries containing figures are also um, pain in the neck right now, um, especially with the legends getting mixed with the text um, of the entries. And um, as perspectives for this thesis, we think that our methodology can be used as guidelines for harvesting, harvesting more annotated data for more advanced experiments. Upon, have, upon having these data, um, more abstract parsing for lexical parsing or semantic enrichment could be investigated. My colleague Pedro Ortiz, uh, Ortiz at INRIA already started investigating this in the context of the BASNIM project. Um, finally, um, we can also think of building a large interconnected database of legacy dictionaries, for example, by means of word um, sense dis disambiguation and entity linking. So um, that's it. Um, thank you for your attention and your questions are welcome. Thank you, Mohamed. Uh, you made uh, about uh, 30 minutes uh, your defense, and that's great. Um, now we will uh, start with uh, by asking questions from the jury. Uh, so we'll start with the referees. Uh, and so as a matter of guideline, uh, you might uh, ask questions for 20, 30 minutes. Uh, for the referees and uh, so you try to, to do something like that. Um, so we'll start with Patrice Bello. Merci Benoit, <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, um, okay, I will try to, you can, you, you hear me, yeah? Do you yes, hear me? Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. because my microphone is, seems very strange today. Okay, so <laughs> thank you Mohamed for, your presentation. Uh, I read your thesis with great interest and would like to thank you for the clarity of your presentation, which I found very clear and well structured. Uh, and moreover, you already answered to some of my questions. So, but I have still, still have many questions to ask. To ask. Uh, yeah, I thought that, that I think that, that your presentation clearly highlights the main scientific and technological difficulties, as well as your proposals and results, and thank you for that. In summary, I think that you deal with an issue that 
kind of a strong impact in many applications of natural language processing or information natural and, and so on. And I really appreciated that you both studied uh, theoretical issues, but also that you proposed uh, some concrete solutions software and you studied the software engineering aspects of the, of the, of the problem. So for a computer science physics, it's not always the case and I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, moreover, you get you got involved in st standardization issues at the international level, and it's very precious too. Um, and lastly, finally, you carried many experiments on different languages. Uh, you organized or participate to open workshops, and uh, so I think that your work is very useful for the scientific community. And I think that he already has good international visibility. Uh, uh, also, thanks to the publications you presented in various communities. So uh, I have some general questions and then more specific questions. I didn't yet decide what, what would be the first one, but oh yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe my first question is about the, about the usability of the solutions mm -hmm. and the estimation of the human effort. Because it seems to me that the meta model you presented is very clear and, and sound, but the genericity of the feature templates, it's not still not very clear for me in practice. I, I mean that you said that, that there, are, there are no magic templates and you presented for example, uh, dealing with Arabic dictionaries as a, a thing you must think about. It's, I, I, it seems to me that you say that it is a bottleneck of, of, the, of your approach. But I mean that because the cascade, cascading passing of the, 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 the human effort to build the new, new templates or to adapt the, the approach and, and so on to a new dictionary can depend on the level of the patterns in the hierarchy or, or it is, so the way we can use your solution for a new dictionary is not very clear for me. How, how could you estimate the human effort to deal with a new, docu, new, new dictionary? Have you defined the standard procedure to help the users or what, what do you plan to use the learning curves uh, to try uh, and so on? Um, well, very good question. Um, actually, um, this difference between the templates that we were, have shown uh, earlier, um, we discovered this lately. Um, so it was like a few months ago. Um, and an idea how to implement this in practice is actually, um, there are many ways actually uh, how we can do this. The, the basic one is actually, um, uh, I've created some um, bash scripts that the user can launch and then um, to try the three variations and then the user can see which one, which one is performing better, which templates is performing better and then um, can just place the template files in a uh, file in the right um, uh, right location and then rerun the training and that's it. And then he will have the best um, of the architecture. Another way would be actually to um, in, implement uh, some um, user interface to, auto, to make this more accessible for uh, people with um, I, limited IT skills. And um, yeah, um, we can, we can. Um, I think we, we, if we can give the hand to the user to um, select the templates that he needs, and then he tries to see the results, that would be a great feature in, in the architecture. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, and about the different approaches, uh, you, you we can use for for passing. I, I mean that you explain very well why deep learning may may not be the solution for everything. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we, we can think about mixing the approaches depending on the, on the document, depending on the, on the text and so on. And 
do you think that it could be a good thing to 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 think about? I mean, definitely. Way to mix. Definitely, I think. I mean, the idea was actually to have a hybrid architecture where we can mix the plain CRF models with more advanced um, models, deep learning models. Um, and that's actually, it's pretty easy within Grobit. We can do this. It's just um, one file to change. Thanks to Patrice again, who made this very, very, uh, Patrice Lopez, uh, who did this. And um, actually we can think about the tool where we can user interface. I mean, the best scenario that I see is actually to have a user interface, like a kind of questionnaire we give to the user to describe quickly his dictionary to select which kind of learning uh, model, uh, machine learning models he wants to use. And then it's kind of customization of the whole architecture that is going to be created. So mm -hmm. that could improve a lot um, the performance of the, the of Grobit dictionaries and um, get and to get also clues from the user um, to make something more customized. Uh -huh. But it, it may be difficult for the user well, I mean, just having an interface where he can select. No, yeah, yeah, but not not for the interface, but for for for, for choosing because may, maybe it, it does not have the well to to to, to choose and don't well, you think that a, a, a dynamic approach can be? Yeah, of course, definitely a dynamic approach that would be the best. But if we want um, have something like less sophisticated we can get some information from the user to adjust this by giving just like a, as long as he has the data, he can then fine tune the, the architecture to use advanced models or just simple models or uh, different categories of features. Okay, my, ne my next question is about the standards. And so you proposed several structurations according to the standard you use, but do you think we can unify the wall? I mean that you use a, a meta, meta structure or an intermediate structure, a pivot st structure. And what is the, the current situation of the connection between LMF and TEI? And does this mean that multiple learning models need to be maintained How to follow changes in standards and what is the, Q, the Q1 situation? Um, well, the situation is um, kind of complex. Actually, the two communities are totally different. So the LMF people, um, they are mostly there. I mean, what, what the work what we are doing at LMF is actually for um, lexical resources and to come up with a meta model for uh, lexical databases. TI is more printed version oriented. Um, these two approaches, for example, the UML diagram that, that I have shown, actually, I think I'm the first one who, uh, who did this for a TI. So if you show this um, to someone who is still doing TI, he will tell you, how can I make this? How can I make use of this? So it's, it's not, um, that's why, for example, the cardinalities, for example, we, uh, mm. we don't see them in the, um, yeah, the yeah, yeah. index zero. Um, Actually, converging between the two standards is possible, but it requires a lot of discussions, a lot of compromises, um, um, getting lexicographers to um, quit their habits to encode information in TI. This is something um, really needs a lot of um, effort. Um, the big dream to have all the these two standards converging at some point, I think we might um, get there some. Um, sometime in the future, especially with what we have done for LMF, where we separated the meta model and we created different parts for TI um, serialization. And we have done already um, a, a tough job um, building four parts, five, uh, how many now, Laurent? Five, six, seven? We have, we have seven, I think, modules. We are trying to synchronize between them and at the same time thinking about TI. I think we can get there sometime, but it's going to be a bit hard to approach these two, uh, get them together. Uh, yeah, because I, I wondered what are the cases where one-to-one -one alignments are not possible between LMF, metamodel classes and TEI P5? 
I, I think that it's not very clearly indicated in your in your dissertation. Um, well, um, one th there are many, not many, but there are some uh, non one to one um, um, mappings between the two standards. For example, the cross ref um, mechanisms mm -hmm. mechanism that I have shown. Um, it's actually implemented um, in two ways. So depending on the case, you can use it. So this is actually one, one case where we have um, different differences between uh, the two standards and the, the, the matching is a bit, um, let's say, uh, delicate. Um, maybe one or two more questions, precise questions. Uh, yeah. Um, about the quality of the optic, optical character recognition. Uh, do you know if the, the degradations you made on the images correspond to the ones we can found on paper dictionaries? Uh, Have you an idea of that? Sorry, could you say it again? Uh, are you looking at the thesis or the presentation? No, on the thesis, yeah, on the thesis, yeah. Because you ch you, you you modified the images in order to estimate the impact of the of the quality of the images on the OCR oh, for the OCR experiment. Yeah, but mm -hmm. is the, is the degradation is faithful to to, to the reality? Well, um, the goal of that experiment is actually, I mean, uh, what we did actually is we took the same dictionary, the same PDF document that we could find um, online. And then we, um, well, the first one was already OCRized. And then uh, the second one, we used another tool called the Transcribus to uh, OCR that document. Um, when this, this um, experiment we did actually for, to show that when you see a PDF document, the, the text layer that is invisible is actually could be very different from another text layer that could be generated with another OCR system. Yeah. So you can see the image that um, actually the quality of the image that we that we used, um, I think it was the same. If you are uh, speaking about the resolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, yeah. I think but, it was the same, but the only difference was actually the OCR system that we have used. That was yeah. the difference. Which but because because the the, re, the the resolution is one power meter, but you yeah, can sure. have ma ma many things on the, on the, on the paper that can. Absolutely, absolutely. If you take it in a dark place, if you take it with your phone, or you do it properly, yeah, you, know, yeah. you can find a lot of variations. Or the dust or anything, <laughs> and so absolutely. it can be yeah 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 okay. Um, you use yeah you use back of words approaches. You know, with n grams, mm -hmm. but what do you think about using bag of characters and grams and not bag of words? That's that's actually a good question. Yeah, um, I think think it might work. We need we, we need um, we need to try this for. Um, yeah, we need we need probably need to try this on the character level. And uh, compare that to the um, to the world level and see how the difference could could be. Um, I don't know. I cannot um, really think of how might be the solution, but might might be better. I'm not sure you are you are looking for something no no um oh, okay okay oh, sorry sorry no, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. sorry i was waiting for you so. oh. Oh, okay. excuse me yeah so well maybe your last last question uh at the end you talk about a more abstract passing as a perspective but at the end what what is your feeling about the task you dealt with i mean how, how do you think it differs from other types of passing? And if you have a new task to deal with, mm -hmm. what what would you, would you do? You talked about 
name and entity recognition. Or I, I don't know clearly remember, but or lexical passing. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think named entity recognition actually, as a continuation of this work, makes a lot of sense for enriching um, the lexical structure. Sorry, the lexical structure that we uh, that we have extracted. I think that could be e easily done, not easily, but relatively easy compared to the task of the lexical parsing, since we have now very state-of-the-art, uh, very advanced state-of-the-art um, named entity recognition systems. Um, so, but for lexical parsing, I I'm still skeptical about the outcome of deep learning models, how we can handle this, because the data could be anything literally anything. And I have seen a lot of unusable data. I'm not sure. I think going by the, our, at least for the, the first, the three first models of our architecture going with classic machine learning is the right way to do it right now. But maybe in the future, we'll have enough data to come up with abstraction of all these um, heterogeneous data that we have right now. But named entity recognition definitely is the way to go and maybe to plug it in at some level of the architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Which was my last question. So thank you again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Patrice. So we'll move to the next referee that is uh, Rute Costa. Bonjour. So um, I, I'm going to speak in French, Thomas. I'm sorry for this, but since we wrote seriously <laughs> since or we wrote seriously? an article in french together so it's you will understand yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry for this um d'abord je voudrais remercier uh, laurent et l'équipe de m'avoir invité à faire partie de, de ce jury et de dire à mohamed que ça me fait grand plaisir uh, d'être là et que cela m'a fait grand plaisir de lire la thèse euh, pendant mes vacances d'été. Euh, ça a été euh, une... Je, connais, je connaissais le travail, de, le travail de, de Mohamed par les articles surtout et par les réunions que nous avons eues, le, que j'ai le plaisir de, de partager avec, avec Mohamed et Laurent dans les réunions de, de ISO. Donc, je connais le travail qui est développé par, par Mohamed. Euh, mais euh, je ne connaissais pas donc, le, le, le travail comme un tout qui, euh, pour nous, linguistes plus traditionnels et lexicographes, euh, de, les vrais lexicographes, euh, c'est un travail qui est vraiment très utile. Et euh, je suis déçue que dans tes contributions, dans ton, dans ton slide 55, tu n'aies pas mentionné les lexicographes, c'est-à-dire que euh, c'est quand même un, un gros travail qui est quand même important pour les lexicographes au-delà de la linguistique. Euh, et et je, je pense que, euh, que euh, je, je, je vais revenir sur deux parties de ton travail. L'un où je sais que je, je vais embêter un petit peu tout le monde parce que c'est toujours mon rôle de linguiste d'embêter tout le monde avec des questions de détail. Et je pense qu'elle que, qu a de l'impact, de mon point de vue, après, sur les décisions que nous prenons pour TEI et pour toutes sortes d'encodages que, que nous allons prendre, mais qui a un rapport avec ce que j'appelle la métalexicographie. Et quand je nomme Laurent, une des fois que j'ai parlé avec lui, oui, mais c'est comme ça qu'on parle, c'est comme ça, c'est la tradition, c'est comme ça que nous parlons dans notre dans notre domaine, mais d'un point de vue lexicographique, il y a quand même des questions qui pourraient être améliorées de mon point de vue et qui auraient des conséquences positives sur les décisions que les encodeurs doivent prendre à un moment donné. Mais je vais, je vais commencer, il y a, je vais me détenir sur deux chapitres parce que je pense que les autres sont beaucoup plus compétents que moi pour faire des, des commentaires sur le reste. Mais je reviens aussi sur le, le chapitre 3, donc sur les, ça, ça va un petit peu dans le sens de ce que Patrice disait, mais par rapport au workshop que tu, que tu as organisé, et je, si te, tu te souviens bien, je t'avais dit qu'à qu Lisbonne, on avait intérêt à t'avoir parmi nous pour organiser un de ces workshops, parce que je serais intéressée à voir, tu dis que tu as eu à peu près 100 participants, 
la question que je te pose, c'est de ces 100 participants, quels, quels étaient les backgrounds, de quelle, quelle est la formation des gens qui ont participé et si effectivement tu avais des, des vrais lexicographes dans ton, dans ton groupe, quand je dis de vrais lexicographes, je veux dire des gens qui éventuellement travaillent avec des dictionnaires, qui travaillent euh, sur les dictages, mais qui ont effectivement euh, des compétences assez réduites dans les, dans les, dans les IT et qui ont des, quelquefois aussi des compétences réduites dans le raisonnement qui est derrière ton système. Et donc, ce qui, me, ce qui pour moi serait intéressant, ce serait de, de tester euh, ou d'avoir un, un workshop pour euh, des linguistes lexicographes euh, ou des professionnels, c'est-à-dire des gens qui travaillent effectivement pour les éditeurs ou des gens qui ont une formation en lexicographie où la, les compétences informatiques ne vont pas toujours au-delà de des utilisateurs compétents. Euh, et donc, je pense effectivement, on en parle aussi dans d'autres contextes, je pense qu'il serait vraiment euh, très important de, de penser à introduire ces compétences dans des formations que nous faisons en lexicographie, parce que je pense que le monde est de votre côté et non pas du nôtre. Et donc, je pense effectivement qu'il faudrait qu'il y ait une synergie entre, les, entre les, les domaines et les disciplines pour que nous puissions, euh, pour que nous puissions euh, mieux travailler ensemble. Et quelquefois, nous entendre avec Thomas euh, je suis désolée de parler en français, mais avec Thomas, par exemple, on a des discussions sur les contenus. Dernièrement, qu'est-ce que c'est une, une, une unité euh, composée ou ce qu'on a décidé d'appeler pour l'instant une unité polylexicale C'est de la linguistique pure et dure, mais elle a des conséquences après sur la modélisation, elle a des conséquences après sur la codification et c'est un peu sur ce quoi j'aimerais parler un petit peu avec toi. Mais par rapport à ce, à ce workshop, dis-moi comment est-ce que, est que vous avez fait une sélection des participants ou est-ce que les participants se sont inscrits euh, parce qu'ils étaient intéressés à avoir de la formation okay. euh, Je réponds en français ou en anglais bon, Comme tu veux, ça m'est égal. Euh, les deux me vont. Mais, oui, euh... oui, 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 comme tu veux, comme tu veux. Thomas, can you can you understand? Can you follow us? Because you are part of the answer, I think. Uh, I would, I I could follow Rute. I would prefer it if you responded in English. If that's not okay. a problem for you. Okay. Okay. Uh, no problem. Uh, okay. Great. Um. So regarding the the participants of the workshops we had, so um, we we didn't actually ask the people to um, um to have a certain profile to uh, to be able to participate to our workshops, um. Main, I mean, a big, big part of the participants were uh, from the lexical um, data masterclass that we had. Uh, we organized, I think, three times. Three times, right? Um, two, just two. Ah, the third one got okay delayed. So two times, and there were like um, between ten and fifteen people who attended, um, who have different, who are coming from different backgrounds. So we have, we had lexicographers, we had linguists, we had. Uh, simply people dealing with uh, different subjects uh, in the humanities. Um, and actually, um, I should be honest at this point that most of the valuable feedback we got actually from lexicographers, where we, they came up with samples where our modeling was not actually 100% valid. So I'm totally, I totally agree with you on the point that a tool to deal with dictionaries should be, lexicographers should play a role in that. And... Um, But also, we, we wanted to make sure that um, not just the, 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 the lexicographers who are going to participate to our workshops, um, and, but we had, we had many, many people who, who were lexicographers. We had people from Oxford, uh, Oxford Press University who were okay. working with dictionaries. Um, that was in South Africa. Um, we, had, I had, I th we had, I think, at least three of them. They were from Oxford Press University. We had people from Belgrade um, uh, um, Humanities, Digital Humanities Center, no? Institute, Institute of Serbian Language, if I remember correctly. Exactly. So uh, they were also lexicographers. 
Uh, we had also lexicographers from Greece. So I think my estimation was like there were at least at least 15 lexicographers who attended. Okay. Our okay. Well, um, well, I invite you to consider to organize the next lexical masterclass in Lisbon. So you are welcome. So we would be very happy to have you. Uh, uh, it would be a pleasure. We would need you to make the bridge between between um, between lexicography, linguists, and uh, the the job you are doing, you are doing. So I think this, and I think also it would be very interesting to have uh, well training material uh, ready to uh, to send out and uh, to so we could use this in our classes in order even to prepare people who go to attend this masterclass. And this could be, this could be an interesting output, I would say, and we, we, we could, you could think about it. Um, so this would be very interesting. Um, um, so my, my other point, so thank you for this information. So it's, I think uh, Ana Salgado, I think she, she was in one of these masterclass, I think, wasn't she in Berlin, I think, yes. So, um, uh, well, we, we are very happy that we have this, uh, this, uh, this important connection. So I would come back to chapter one and, uh, sorry, yes. Uh, so le, le chapitre que tu as intitulé Dictionary Resources. Mm -hmm. uh, là, j ai, j ai, là, mon problème se situe au niveau euh, du mon problème, c'est pas un problème, c'est une discussion que j'aimerais avoir euh, avec avec toi, euh, qui est en fait euh, qui a un rapport avec la métalexicographie euh, qui est utilisée dans ton dans ton chapitre où j'ai quelques doutes et où euh, je j'ai j'ai où j'ai des problèmes si tu veux à chaque fois que je dois euh, travailler ou que je dois annoter et j'ai des problèmes non pas euh, parce que euh, les standards m'offrent un problème éventuellement, mais surtout, je ne sais pas de quoi la communauté parle quand elle se réfère, par exemple, à Headword ou ce qu'elle se réfère à LEM ou ce qu'elle se réfère, parce que dans toute communauté ou pratiquement dans toutes les communautés, on a des entendements différents par rapport à chacun de ces éléments. Et comme il est de, de ta connaissance en linguistique, je pense que c'est un petit peu vrai partout, mais en linguistique, on a, il y a toujours un, la terminologie est dépendante d'une euh, école de pensée, et ce qui rend la chose plus compliquée encore. Et ce qu'on avait essayé de faire à un moment donné, c'est d'avoir un, un, une terminologie qui puisse être supra-théorique, euh, supra c'est-à-dire que qui puisse être utilisée indépendamment, qu'on soit générativiste, qu'on soit de la linguistique cognitive ou qu'on soit du structuralisme, ça nous faciliterait, disons-le, pour, pour pouvoir arriver à, des, à, à, de meilleurs, ou à, à faciliter le travail des lexicographes qui, eux, au fait, n'ont pas une formation en linguistique aussi forte qu que cela. Et donc, quelquefois, les lexicographes, ils ont, des, ils, ont des, ils ont des lacunes, que ce soit dans l'informatique, mais aussi, dans des, dans des, aussi en linguistique. Donc, on a un double problème, quelquefois, quelquefois à résoudre. Donc, je, je vais essayer de revenir ici sur sa thèse. Et donc, la première, la première question que je te posais, et que tu as insisté à nouveau dans ta présentation, c'est que euh, je n'ai pas tout à fait le même entendement que toi euh, par euh, ce qu'on entend par un dictionnaire onomasiologique. Ma, ma, la question que je te pose est, est-ce qu'il est… Je ne comprends pas pourquoi tu dis que les dictionnaires onomasiologiques restent en dehors de tes objectifs Étant donné que pour moi, l'onomasiologie et la sémasiologie, et leur différence se situe par rapport à la méthodologie qui est utilisée et non pas forcément par rapport à l'objet final. Donc, on, à quoi as-tu pensé quand tu, quand tu dis « les dictionnaires onomasiologiques ne m'intéressent pas » dans ce contexte de cette thèse, parce que que ce soit onomasiologique ou sémasiologique, 
nous avons quand même des, une structure de la microstructure qui est quand même semblable. C'est de la langue, en fait. Pourquoi tu, pourquoi tu veux, pourquoi tu, tu, tu le dis plusieurs fois dans ta thèse, je dis, je ne veux pas travailler les dictionnaires. Ça, c'est une question, c'est même pas, c'est pas, pas une critique, je suis curieuse de savoir pourquoi tu fais cette différence. Um, alors, um... Très bonne question. You can, you can speak in English, so no problem. I don't know if I'm going to offend uh, French-speaking people or English-speaking people. So, Monsieur le Président, uh, quelle langue? You decide. You. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, this this question about um, the, about the, uh, why we were focused and why I insisted on on um, being uh, focused just on, uh, on uh, semasiological dictionaries is actually the fact that um, there is first, um, th there is a difference on the logical level of the organization of between semasiological and semasio uh, onomasiological and semasiological uh, dictionaries. Um, we had already enough, um, how can I say, enough diverse issues to make things converge together with standards. Um, and that was just for the um, semasiological uh, category. So adding to that another layer of complexity where we have to take into consideration a new logical structure. Um, by the way, that's possible. Um, I have implemented the version of Robert Dictionaries for um, the Charles University in Prague where we are dealing with onomasiological dictionary. But the change was a, was important in the structure of the actual uh, uh, architecture. So, um, and that's why we wanted to kind of have a limit of this work, focus on this. But um, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't put that in the perspectives that, that could have been a very interesting point to actually um, uh, work with um, onomasiological dictionaries and maybe how we can um, adapt um, the, actual, the actual architecture to parse new um, new category of dictionaries. Okay, so uh, I, I understand. I understand what you mean. I understand. Um, so I'm I'm happy with that. Yes, and probably because I still didn't come to Lisbon to have the master class. <laughs> yes, probably. The master probably. class, the master classes that we had and the workshop that we had, no one with it, so no massological dictionary came to ask me if I could make it work. So that's probably yes. I was biased by the fact that the users of the tool were actually more semasiological focused. Well, so. in fact, I think what would be interesting, in fact, is to see if there is, uh, well, I agree with you, we, there, there is a, a different philosophy uh, behind these two types of dictionary, uh, but sometimes you have onomasiological dictionaries you, you, that don't have a different type that are the same as semasiological dictionaries. So it would be interesting if you could compare the, the arch... Si, si, non, je parle en anglais. Si, si, on, pouvait, si on pouvait comparer uh, les architectures des, des, des deux types de dictionnaires uh, pour voir effectivement s'il y a une différence. Parce que la définition que tu donnes de, de, de dictionnaire uh, onomasiologique, c'est au fait pas la même que j'ai moi, c'est-à-dire j'ai une autre perspective de l'onomasiologie et je me demande au fait, et là c'est ma deuxième question, euh, quel est le rapport dans, dans, dans ta perspective et, et dans la définition que tu donnes de dictionnaire onomasiologique Donc je suppose que tu donnes cette définition parce que c'est la définition qui est utilisée dans le contexte dans lequel tu travailles mais based on a possible synonymy of the words. Je, quel est le rapport entre la synonymie et euh, l'onomasiologie Tu euh, l'as dit à la page, je pense que c'est à la page 7, je pense. Donc, c'est tout de suite la première page de, ton, de ta thèse. Oui, je, je vois la page, oui. C'est la ouais. première page du chapitre. Oui, exactement, exactement. Après, tu dis, il essaie de répondre à la question, comment est-ce concept exprimé Alors, je ne vois pas la relation entre la question que tu poses et puis l'affirmation que tu avais fait euh, d'abord. Et dans le même contexte, pour que tu puisses répondre euh, à ce que tu veux dans, un, dans ce même contexte, si tu regardes la figure 2.1 
et la figure 2-2. De pourquoi la figure 1 est une approche onomasiologique Et pourquoi la figure… Donc, la différence que tu fais, je, 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 je le, personnellement, je ne la représenterai pas comme ça. Donc, si tu essayais de, de m'expliquer quel est le point de vue de cette, de cette figure 2-1 de et de la figure 2-2. De um, bon… Um... Euh, c'est vrai que euh, sur le côté lexicographique, euh, je ne me considère pas comme un lexicographe, j'ai des connaissances oui, oui. lexicographiques. Euh, je, je crois que c'est tout à fait. Um... Oh, sorry, uh, Thomas. Uh, I think I'm, I'm, I might offend a lot of people when I'm dealing with some lexicographic um, subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as I see this more from the computational perspective. Point of view, yes. So. Um, For me, I, I'm, I have the two, two actually two, um, how can I say, two uh, points, two perspectives that I um, evaluate the dictionary from is actually the logical stru structure and the physical structure of the document. Mm -hmm. um, I, I totally agree with you that this might be a bit confusing, the definition that I have, uh, that I've put in the thesis, um, but um, that was again from an, the eyes of, uh, Um, a computer scientist yes. who, who can, but I'm, I'm, I'm totally open to modify this and to adapt it um, to be more compliant. Or, or you don't agree at all with the, the whole- No, 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 no. Uh, I think, uh, I, I understand what you mean. Um, I, I only think that, uh, well, uh, uh, that, that it would have been, but I, I understand since you come from, from an IT world that it's obvious for all of you that it's like that. Uh, but that's, that's the problem with multidisciplinarity. I mean, uh, all the time when you have a connection with uh, an, an, another subject field. So, well, that's exactly in the connection where people are going to ask you for, for questions. And since when I have people in my university who talk about ontology, so the first thing I ask everybody to do is to give their own definition about the concept they are going to use, considering that there is a, a different definition. So what we mean by vocabulary is not the same thing what an ontologist means, what we mean by grammar is not the same thing. So what we have to do in this context is, well, we have to, We have to, uh, to give and say, in lexicography, this is the definition in IT, this is the definition in this context, that's what we mean. So this is for us linguists very important because, um, well, we, are, we, we deal with words every day and we are asking all the time, what do you mean by X and so on. So, no, it's not that I'm, I don't agree. It's only I would like to understand your point of view since it's different from my point of view. I'm not saying that it's not correct or that you should change uh, something. Okay? Yeah, but I, I totally agree with you on the fact that, I mean, I'm actually happy to, to, to trigger this kind of discussion because I think that the computational world and the, the humanities and lexicography world are two separate worlds. Like each one is living in his own a sphere and um, one of the things that I had to develop during my thesis is actually to communicate, to be able to communicate with lexicographers and linguists, making mistakes sometimes, saying stupid things in the, from their perspective. Everybody says stupid things when it comes to other yeah. disciplines, so that's yeah. not, so no I problem tried, at all. I tried to be in the middle of them. That was actually, had, had a kind of cost because I was, this actually needs an effort, need to organize Um, workshops to 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 um, to to see what is the need, but I think less people are doing this nowadays. I mean, um, not very people who are work focused on linking the two words. People are working on their models, how to make them um, the most deep uh, possible. Other people are working using their um, rule-based techniques and um, handmade. Um, Yes, so I'm, 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 I'm very used to be in a context where nobody listens to me. So uh, I'm very happy when I find someone who, who agrees to talk to me about these things and to, and to listen a little bit to what we have to say. Um, so that it's, it's, it's no problem at, uh, well, I'm, 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 I, 
I'm very happy to be able to have the chance to, to have this discussion with you. So another question would be, and it will also be the last one, but I'm trying to find this here in, we. sorry, I'm trying to find here in, uh, no, that's your PowerPoint, sorry, I want to go to. So it should be the topic where, sorry, uh, it should be the topic where you define, let me see, I think it's page, it's not the multilingual dimension, it would be, well, when you give the, uh, okay, it's page, page uh, 18, mm -hmm. 18, when you talk about the logical structure, okay, mm -hmm. and well, I think Toma will laugh now, because, well, I have some doubts about when you say about the definition you give about headwords, about variant form, for instance, about, um, well, sense. Sense is a big problem for me. So okay. in, in the context of Alexis, I, I, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of doubts about the what do you mean by a sense? But in any case, you say had were called also lemma. Well, I don't think it's the same thing. Or do you think it's the same? For me, had work is, I would say it's, uh, uh, une caisse où tu mets du contenu et le contenu c'est le lemme. C'est-à-dire que je, je peux comprendre que dans un discours euh, euh, de tous les jours, on puisse dire euh, « hard work » parce que nous savons que nous nous référons à des lèvres. Mais d'un point de vue théorique de la, de la, de la lexicographie, euh, pour moi, ce n'est pas la même chose. C'est-à-dire on a un « hard work euh, » qui est, qui, qui est un lèvre, mais ce n'est pas un lèvre. Je ne sais pas si tu vois où je… Où je veux, je veux en venir. Donc, il y a une question de, de métalexicographie et que je pense que par, euh, par, par extension, on finit, ou on finit par les considérer synonymes alors que dans, la, que dans le contexte, ils ne le sont pas non plus. À un moment donné, tu dis, euh, tu dis aussi euh, lexical, lexical entries, alors que je pense que tu ne parles pas de lexical entries, que tu parles d'articles lexicographiques. Donc, pour moi, la structure, c'est l'article lexicographique et à l'intérieur, tu as un ensemble d'informations qui peut être classé ou qui peut être nommé d'une certaine façon. Pour nous, lexicographe, quand tu, tu verras, quand éventuellement on pourrait, quand on commencera à travailler ensemble, si, 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 si cela va se, se poser, tu verras qu'une chose, c'est la métalexicographie et puis l'autre, c'est la terminologie de la lexicologie qui, qui doit... Euh, intervenir dans ce, dans ce contexte-là. Et c'est pour ça que euh, ça, c'est vraiment, peut-être pour vous, c'est une question de, de détail et que ce n'est vraiment pas important. Pour nous, ça a une importance, effectivement. Le, le, la question que je te pose est par rapport, et c'est ma dernière question que je te pose, c'est par rapport au sens. C'est mmh. quoi un sens Parce qu'au fait, quand tu parles de sens, représente one possible meaning of the head word. Je ne pense pas que c'est le head word qui a un meaning. Je pense que c'est le lemme qui a un sens, mais qui est exprimé à travers les définitions, les exemples, les domaines d'usage. Pour moi, c'est vraiment très, très, très vaste. Et euh, que, que l'on puisse considérer des définitions, euh, un sens, euh, on pourra être d'accord on puisse considérer des exemples un, des, des, des sens, ça me pose un petit problème, et que l'on puisse considérer des marques de domaine comme étant un sens, ça participe à la construction du sens. Nous sommes tout à fait d'accord, mais d'un point de vue, ce n'est peut-être pas un sens. Je te pose la question tout en sachant que c'est probablement un détail pour toi et que ça n'a aucune conséquence sur son, ton travail d'ingénieur, que ça peut avoir une conséquence au moment de l'encodage. Alors, je te demande tout simplement par rapport à ces questions-là, et je sais que la communauté travaille comme ça, par exemple, même dans, dans, 
Donc, tout, tout, toutes les normes, quand on travaille, on, on parle de traduction, par exemple, ça me pose un très grand problème. J'avais déjà fait le commentaire, mais on me dit que c'est la terminologie qui est utilisée. Et euh, je suis à un stade où, où j'arrive déjà à, à parler moi-même de traduction quand on parle de, de sens bilingue, disons-le. Um, well, the, the, the definition of, of the terms that we used here is actually based, I mean, this, this discussion is really interesting discussion and we had it also within um, the ISO meetings, so especially for the LMF, where we had to actually define each term and come up with a clear terminology for the users of the standard. Um, even, even within the TI like zero group, I think we had it with Piotr and uh, other um, um, experts where we had this kind of discussion where Um, each one from his point of view doesn't agree with the other one. So um, especially um, if you see things from different perspectives, that's, that's al always the case. And I've, I, I agree with you that this is something that should be clarified. Um, and we have certain set terminologies for certain domains where we can use it and we make sure that we cover um, the definition of certain terms um, in, the, in their right context. So here, basically, what we did is actually I had to look on the LMF, um, 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 LMF definition. Information. Of, yeah. Also, I had I I I, I looked at this also from different um, documents for lexicographers. To be honest, I didn't ask a lexicographer, a proper lexicographer. I don't know if Laurent is considered as a lexicographer or not, but I don't think so. I don't consider him a lexicographer. But... Oh. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that, that could explain things, I think. Uh, so, yes. <laughs> so, uh, in any case, I, I could tell Anna, Anna Salgado, that uh, when I read your thesis, that I can understand um, some uh, where she comes with some of her terminology. So now we have uh, we. Bella, Laurent touch. So. We can we can talk about this from now on. Yeah. Okay, but I'm I'm really open to to refine this if you find it like more uh, appropriate to have like a. But also at the same time we need to I mean we need to uh, keep in mind that this is a thesis for computer science. So uh, yeah, exactly, I think with... it's it's perfect for your thesis. Don't change anything for the thesis. Okay. From my point of view, it's perfect. It's yeah. only an intellectual pleasure. To 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 mm -hmm. fight with you uh, in this in this question concerning linguists. So no, don't change it. it it's it's fine. And again, I like very much to read your thesis, and I learned a lot. And I I'm very happy that you finally came to this to the end of this work. Congratulations. Glad to, to hear that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your questions. So we can uh, move to Thomas, I guess that's fair, yeah. So what's your turn? Sure, thank you. Um, I, uh, I can assure you, Mohammed, that uh, even Ruta and I, who supposedly come from the same frame, you know, intellectual framework, don't always agree. And I think we did have long Uh, fights about whether Edward and Lemma are the same thing or not already. So these things are um, difficult to, to um, you know, it's very difficult to find a common framework for, for these kind of terminological um, discussions. But I do want to say that I think, even though you, you stressed again that this is a thesis for um, in computer science, Uh, the impact and the importance of your work certainly goes beyond uh, computer science. And I was myself very, uh, I consider myself lucky that I've followed your work um, over the past few years and I've seen the results. And so for me also, it's been a great pleasure to um, finally read your thesis and see how it all comes together. And there's there's um, two things that I want to stress first as, as the the main qualities from my point of view. First of all, overall, uh, the structure of the thesis and the, you know, it's very well paced. You set out the problem really well and then you lead us through all the different phases of the work. And I think you did a very, very good job. And so by the time we get to chapter four, 
and we get into these, you know, cascading, iterating, parsing um, workflows, um, I think everybody, including a person without computer science, will be able to follow and to understand it. That's no uh, small achievement. And I know that it comes also from your experience of working with lexicographers and having to explain things many times. Uh, but I think that's a very, uh, very um, important thing that you did. And the other thing that has been mentioned before, but I really want to highlight it again, um, the, the kind of, you know, NLP and, and lexicography being two different communities um, is, is a curious historical development because as you know, we started off together in the 40s with Vusa and, and Lexicon Thomisticus and all these early works with IBM on putting words into computers. Um, and then, and so in the early, I think 50s and 60s, even though those were the same communities and they started diverging later. And I think that's a, that's a big shame. And maybe now we are coming at a point where we can, we, and your thesis certainly is, is a good step in that direction that we can bring these communities uh, closer together. And Alexis is an example of a project that at least in theory is attempting to do something like that. So, so I think this situates your, your work at a, at a very interesting historical juncture. Um, having said that, I think from the point of view of a, of a humanist reading this thesis, it would have been um, good to maybe highlight a little bit more the, the historical context of um, how tools um, developed and, and how these two communities uh, developed. It's a matter of a couple of paragraphs. You don't have to do it. I'm just saying it would be, um, it would be interesting to um, situate your work in a, in a, in a more historical context. Um, in terms of uh, concrete questions and, and remarks, I'll, uh, Ruta already stole the question about users and I wanted to focus on the users, but uh, maybe from a different aspect, but we'll see if I have time, I'll address that. If not, um, we can talk about it some other time. What I do want to question is your um, typology of dictionaries. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is another example where um, maybe some references to lexicographic literature would have been helpful because you, first of all, there are many different kinds of typologies, right? You can, people have written books on, you know, different kinds of dictionaries and things like that. Some of these are not relevant for your work. So whether a dictionary is um, uh, descriptive or prescriptive doesn't matter for you, right? So you could say, these are the categories that don't matter to me, but the ones that matter, and those are the ones that you mention, you end up in a strange position because you claim that con you know, based on the content, you can define dictionaries as lexical, encyclopedic, or etymological. But for me, that's a little bit mixing apples and oranges, right? Because one thing is, is the question of, of content, whether it's what in German you could say is Sprachlexikographie or Sachlexikographie. So is it about words or things? But etymology or diachrony is not, a, is not on the same level of categorization. It has to do with the, with the temporal scope of the language described by the dictionary. What do you say to that? Um, I do agree with you that this levels of classifications that we, um, that I have, that we put in, in the thesis, it's not, um, it's kind of, yeah, mixing apples and origins, as you said. Um, but um, what we, I mean, this is something also, again, a bias from something coming from the NLP community where um, etymology, I think this is something that I start hearing, hearing about and touching when I started my thesis. Before that, I had just lexical and encyclopedic. So, and that's, that's what could explain actually why etymology is so left out. Why, for example, in LMF, just lately when we started adding a new module for etymology, and I think LMF is the right illustration, a perfect illustration of the issue where the etymology was not considered 
as an information that should be modeled within a lexical database. Mm -hmm. So um, you see here the bias and how things are getting, I mean, um, you, have, you are seeing now a better version of me regarding lexicographic things because I got to, get, um, to, to deal with lexicographers and see this, these issues and how, um, how you could also scream when you see such a classification from a perspective from a, of a lexicographer. Um, but I do agree that th there is not, not just three classes of dictionaries. I've seen uh, many dictionaries and this definitely should be, um, there should be a movement to push this within the NLP field. So to, to, uh, to um, valorize, to give more value to other dictionaries that they were not considered, for example, from because they didn't fall in one of these classes. Sure. And, and in a similar vein, I think you, sh you should try also to be um, careful about how you name your categories. Because one of the one of the you know you you describe dictionaries in terms of content and then you describe them in terms of multilinguality, but mm -hmm. one of the one of the um, aspects or members of this class is monolingual dictionaries. So, mm -hmm. to me, that's less than ideal, right? It's about language, and then you can have one, two, or three languages rather than multilinguality and then have a monolingual. It's a small point, but you you get what I mean. Yeah. Um, now, um, I just, I will skip the, the user bit. I just want to uh, say that what I really liked and what, what was shown, I mean, your, your care about the user was that you tried within the you know, available time to do as much as possible, including to create um, relaxed NG schemas for each model and CSS style sheets so that you make it easier for people to annotate text. I think it's super important to, to uh, congratulate you on that because often, um, with exceptions of course, but NLP um, or, or computer science pieces don't, um, well, let's say not, not often. I, don't, I also don't want to offend anyone, but don't always address the user in this way. So I think this was very, um, very important. Now, if you, if you allow me uh, to turn to um, page, I think, where is the example with abuse? Uh, the thesis, right? In the thesis, yes, yes, yes. Just... Or maybe it's, Page 63, let's see if it's 63, maybe it's not. Um, I've got one, page 19. Yeah, the with, you mean the, um, for the homographs? Yes, I homographs. Do you see my screen? It, let me see. Uh, yes, yes, that's the one. Okay. Now, when I read your text, um, it's, it implies that, yeah, show us, show us the, mm -hmm. uh, go, go up so that we see those two act and abuse. Now, reading your narrative, it you, you correctly say the dictionaries are not always consistent, right? And we, those of us who work on historical lexicography couldn't agree more, it's, it's a fact of life, et cetera. With this example, you wanted to show that you can have a homograph that is in one case encoded as um, different senses and in other cases, different entries, mm -hmm. right? But there is a big difference between these two. Well, big, big is again an exaggeration. There's an important, a significant lexicographic difference between these two entries. Can you? Guess what I'm what I'm what I'm thinking about right now. Must I zoom so I can see? Um. <laughs> Laurent is raising his his hand, but I will not allow him to answer. <laughs> so both are homographs. One is noun. One is verb. Abuse. 
uh, the pronunciation. It's different. Yes. So which so makes is... them, which hmm? makes them, which makes them not perfect homographs. I mean, homograph. It's about written, but it's not about the. No, I I think they're still homographs. What I'm trying to get at here. Mm. is that there is internal logic. I, I'm not the one who <laughs> to say that lexicographers are always right. But in this particular case, there is an internal logic to why uh, act is one entry and abuse is two. Mm. And the internal logic from the lexicographer's perspective, from this lexicographer's perspective, is, is that if the pronunciation is different, and then you have two entries. Then you have two. Mm. So it's it's a small detail, but that that is not mentioned in your thesis. And I think it's important. It's important oh. to do the work that you do, but it's also important to try to understand why uh, the original authors did something the way they did. And this is this is a good example for that. Yeah. Definitely. I'm not blaming people for not being inconsistent where they are consistent, but I don't understand. True. Exactly. So that's just just that. Um, there's there's small things on. I can send you some small corrections if you care, but yeah, that sure. that I wouldn't. Uh, but I would I would just say say one more thing, and because we're running out of time, and and give my colleagues um, a chance. Just one suggestion. Uh, I do agree with you that. Um, and you phrase it, you put it like this, that the ontolog slamon remains insufficiently mature to cover the modeling requirements in print dictionary. I think that's a, it's a judgment, but I can understand why you're making it. I do think, however, that for the sake of fairness and completeness, uh, you should have mentioned the um, so-called so -called lexicography module of Ontolex Lemon, right? Because what you focus on is mainly the core module and you explain a couple of other modules that are, you know, for forms and this and that. But actually the Ontolex Lemon community did respond to the criticism that they can't deal with collection of entries, that the Ontolex Lemon was always about individual lexical entries. And so the lexicography module was created to address that issue, how you, uh, put entries together or how you represent entries from um, a dictionary page. So it's just a, a, a small addition that I think would, would make the, your description uh, more complete. Okay, noted. And I could go on, but in the interest of time, I would, I would give the floor back to uh, my colleagues. Thank okay. you, Mohammed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Uh, and then I uh, will give the floor to Patrice Lopez. <clears throat> okay, so I think I'm on mute, um, so you can hear me. Yes, we do. So thank you, Mohamed, and um, uh, thank you also for inviting me in the, in the committee. In the PhD thesis committee. So I, I, I like your, so, okay, so just to summarize, I find your work very good. Okay, so I could stop there, but I'm going to just say a couple of things. Um, so uh, so basically the dissertation is, is really good, I think, because uh, it's not boring. So it's a good point because I remember my PhD dissertation. And, okay. Uh, and also it's very uh, detailed and concrete. It's embracing a, a large set of issues, but it's always a, quite didactic and um, you can follow quite easily everything. So I like very much three things, just wanted to say that. Uh, I like the fact that it's really end-to-end. -end. It's a system that really evaluates documents processing end-to-end -end because it's very not frequent in general. And it was not done for dictionary, so that's very uh, interesting to have a snapshot of the performance of machine learning for extracting uh, structural information end-to-end. -end. That's very interesting. Of course, I like very much the fact that it's an implemented system where, where you engage a, a community and it's not just a prototype. And so, but it was already said, so um, it's very, uh, so that, okay, I don't insist. And what, what I like also very much is the, maybe the first time I see really in a very clear fashion the, 
the parallelism between uh, some sort of modeling of structure information to be extracted. So here we have a kind of hierarchical representation based on TEI, which offers also an encoding and a serialization. And we have a parallelism with the hierarchy of CRF models that we are going to combine in Cascade. So that's the, the figure uh, 615 actually. And I find it very interesting because there's this kind of um, homomorphism. So it's, uh, it's very close and it's very similar to what, we, uh, what, what I was trying to do and what I did with papers, scientific papers. Mm -hmm. So we define an encoding which captures some sort of expert understanding and expert logic for the structure representation. And it helps to combine machine learning models. So we use the expert knowledge, humans, to know how to combine efficiently and in kind of well, logical manner, some kind of specialized machine, learn, uh, machine learning models. And uh, so, so if you do a t-shirt with figure 615, you can send me one, please. 615, oh, you mean on the slides or? Oh, you make a t-shirt with this figure and you send me the t-shirt. Ah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Okay, so maybe one thing uh, missing, which uh, uh, from the pure machine learning perspective, I, I would have been interested to see is a pure inter annotator agreement. So you take really two annotators, you ask them in parallel to, to annotate the page, one page, and you compute the, the, just the difference. It gives an hint about the complexity of the task. Because of course, you talk about the agreement between standards, but that's, uh, one of our way to see that is really from the data, actually, where people disagree, actually, from, uh, and also it gives an idea about how complicated is the, is the mutation, but also the predictions, because there might be some sort of ambiguity behind the scene, and okay. I think, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, that's why I call the data that um, I, annotate, I annotated as silver standard data, not gold standard, because I was the only one who annotated the data. Um, and I think we need more than two because I don't think that two people will agree. We need a third one to at least have some democracy when uh, how to model something. And this is something that I've seen a lot during my thesis, how people yeah. don't agree. No, I think, um, well, so, so I've worked a lot on, on models and annotation and engaging people to annotate. And I think it's very useful also uh, because there is this reconciliation task. Definitely. People, the two people or the three, or, you know, they look where they disagree, they don't agree, they, they create guidelines. And actually it's a guide to, um, um, well, to think about the difficulties and to clarify things. But um, well, okay, I yeah. think that it's complicated to get uh, properly. Yeah. Um, okay, so I just have two short questions, uh, try to be fast. Uh, so one thing I appreciate is the, <clears throat> this kind of huge effort on building a, a running system that can work on any machines and engaging the community, uh, this workshop series you made. And <clears throat> so uh, more and more actually, so uh, researchers are writing software, it's more and more frequent. And um, I'm, I'm personally, I'm very interested in, the, in how we can actually make, make researchers write more code and write less articles. So somehow um, how to improve the visibility of the software the research software, how to value them, or to, how to credit researchers about software. So I would like to ask you after these uh, years of development and trying to uh, present this work, how you think we could improve that? What's, what's the lesson you, you take from the, the pure research artifact, which mm -hmm. is a software? Well, actually, um, I think, um... When, when you have a look at the ACL proceedings, for example, um, you can see less and less papers who are dealing, dealing with, for example, standardization or dealing with implementing infrastructure. They are, I think it's kind of big bubble of deep learning. Um, it's, it's interesting, but at some point you feel that it's boring because everyone is going in the same direction. You don't feel that this new thing that you don't give we don't give credit to researchers who are working actually on software and making other researchers able to, to carry, um, carry out their research. So I, I totally agree with you that um, this is something um, uh, in the field of NLP, this is something left out. 
kind of. Um, people are waiting now for Google or Facebook um, to build them some infrastructure to carry out their research. But actually, researchers, researchers themselves could build this, and they are able to do this um, with um, how how you say it? It's like a ads served with um, and the, the the ads that you put on the documentation of um, Grovit ads served with um, morals principles, something like that. It's like not commercial. It's like people doing research for research, helping other researchers by providing tools. And it's a, and it's it's like a huge field. How you can improve what is uh, what is there? How how you can make use of what is there? And don't just think or always about the sophisticated things. Even simple things could work if they are put together in the right way, and they are tuned in uh, also in the right way. So um, I think this is this this thing should be valued more in the community. Um, so we could help researchers and other people from other fields. Um, to carry out their research. And the, the corollary, so about Growbit, for instance, which was a big build as an infrastructure to create a lot of specialized modules. And what do you think could be improved? In Growbit or Growbit dictionaries? Growbit. Because you are a user of Growbit with Growbit. Yeah. yeah. For, for I mean, I mean, what, what you, um, Patrice Lopez and Laurent Romari, one day you initiated this somewhere in Berlin. It was, it's, it's a great thing. I mean, thanks to Grobit, now I'm having a job um, where I have to use Grobit. I have to tweak it further on new materials, on new um, stuff. It's, it's great. It has a lot of, um, a lot of usable uh, features. One thing that I had to deal with during my thesis is actually understanding um, the code and the philosophy behind it. And you can see the change in the philosophy. You can change because there were many people involved in the design of the tool. At some point, it was a bit hard to make it more modular. You feel like it's kind of was designed for one specific use case where it could have been more um, generalized and used for other kind of type of documents. So. That was a, that, that's one thing that we could work on. I think we started already this, like thanks to the Grobit camps that we had, we managed a bit to make it more flexible, but I think there is still the work to be done on in this direction. Um, also, um, I mean, Grobit, you could use it for almost for everything. I mean, um, the amount of documents, I mean, if you know how to make the models more dynamic to create. For example, if you imagine a class that is going to create models dynamically where you put the labels that you want to use and um, kind of you come up with a workflow that is um, common to train and um, to evaluate the models, I think you can come up with something that is more generic and is able to parse almost any documents plus um, the, you need to have more hints and clues in, in the CRF models and other models to um, capture the logical structure and the physical structure of a document. I don't know. The answer, my answer, I think it was a bit long. Um, no, well, this is from my concerns. No, about... I, I'm, 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 I was curious about your opinion because uh, you, you worked so much time with, with uh, using this, well, this species of Grobit, so it's uh, very interesting. Yeah. Just last question. Uh, so, uh, so we see that okay, when we uh, when you evaluate the models on unseen dictionaries, and when you so uh, work uh, beyond dictionaries, mm -hmm. um, we have good results on dictionaries uh, with maybe uh, 10, 20 pages already as training data. Mm -hmm. But that, that remains very specialized, and it's hard to uh, generalize actually to. Uh, new dictionaries and new type of document. But still, I wanted to, to ask you about your feeling. Uh, what should be addressed to, to gain some generalization? So should we add visual clue? What's your opinion now after working um, on that, mm -hmm. where we should focus to try to get this generalization? I think um, one, I mean, very good question. Um, um, the, the, I think one one thing that we could do is actually, other than the visual clues that you could add, try to extract as maximum as as much as possible from the documents, visual clues that help um, the model to um, have more features to use to structure the, the documents. 
I think we could have some kind of um, a pre-processing module where um, from the metadata, from many information around the document, you can tell which kind of features that you are going to use. For example, if you are going to deal with, um, I mean, uh, a dictionary that has very long entries and um, maybe you direct um, the, the, the processing of the pipeline, the, um, the pipeline of processing elements to a direction where more sophisticated feature templates um, could be used, for example. So this kind of um, rapid analysis, analysis of the document, I think that could help um, to um, select which are the models, which kind of models that we should use. Maybe we should use deep learning models when it's kind of like a um, consistent and um, um, a short entries. Maybe we should then use CRF when the entries are too long. So I think this kind of small module that we have, kind of document switcher that we have at the beginning of the pipeline, that could help a lot improving the, the, the infrastructure. I see. So some kind of meta learning pipe for the pipeline itself. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, but okay. Well, it's difficult. But okay. Uh, I, I, actually, I agree uh, on that. Uh, well, for me, that's it. Um, so I'm not going to be uh, take more time. Just by saying that uh, I really like reading the dissertation. Thank. You. Very nice. It's, uh, it's not well. Yeah. I learned things about dictionaries. I'm actually. Uh, happy about that so um, thank you glad to hear that thank you thank you uh, we move to the next uh, member of the committee so that charlie mort uh, so... alors tout d'abord je voudrais m'excuser de ne pas parler français je suis très favorable au multilingualisme <laughs> mais mon français ne serait pas ne serait trop gênant pour cette tâche that's why i switch to english which which I'm thank you thank you Charlie for Toma <laughs> um, yeah where to start uh, as you know my, my, my background is humanities uh, and uh, having read uh, Muhammad's thesis uh, I, I, I really had the feeling of having read something that is useful which is very often not the case when you read humanities theses uh, all in all, I liked it very much, and uh, I'm quite amazed by uh, the challenges you have overcome in translating between the communities, which I, I guess is one uh, of, of the, the real big challenges. I mean, uh, uh, we, we are at the Center for Digital Humanities are being confronted with each and every day. Uh, I think you thesis very nicely merges both theoretical approaches and then translating them into into something very practical and very useful it, especially uh, as this is happening in a field that uh, has been puzzling and fascinating me for a long time uh, i mean looking at dictionaries uh, from the outside, one easily gets the impression that uh, one hardly could conceive of anything that is more stringently structured, uh, where everything is in its place, and which actually by a machine should be uh, easily uh, identifiable, which obviously, as we have learned over the past couple of years, is not the case. Uh, there are so many problems involved uh, to which you have uh, found a couple of, of solutions already. Uh, I think we are far from being there yet, but Grobit dictionaries are definitely a big stride uh, ahead in this respect. And of course, we all keep dreaming of the black box where you just throw your dictionary in, your PDF file in, and on the other side, get your nicely structured TI or LMF uh, encoded uh, result out. Um, many very relevant questions have uh, already been put forward. Uh, I, I'd like to come up, well, I'd 
a little bit well on, 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 on two issues. Mm -hmm. We're starting and moving back to the whole thing of modeling and uh, you were talking about print versus print dictionaries versus database uh, oriented uh, uh, approaches, uh, Lex Zero versus LMF when we translate it into, into the standards. Uh, as most of the input I've seen in uh, your thesis and also what I've seen uh, in, the, in the workshops, uh, are basically print dictionaries. Uh, I was wondering uh, to which degree uh, LMF has really played an important role for, uh, for the task at hand. Uh, as LMF obviously is rather something that pertains to the database oriented community. I, I mean, that would be my, my first question. And in relation to this, did you uh, identify beyond the etymolog etymology uh, part, did you identify any conceptual lacuna in, uh, in, in LMF? I mean, I still remember a couple of years ago when uh, we only had the old LMF uh, 2008 standard, I was trying uh, to convert some of our data from TI towards LMF and uh, still remember at that time I got stuck because there were simply a lot of concepts, constructs not available in, in LMF, which I had many workarounds in the more flexible TI. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so for the first question regarding how LMF helped um, us um, shaping grubby dictionaries, well, actually, it's it's a funny story that I, I used LMF during my bachelor's and master thesis, um, and I had to suffer a lot from using LMF. Um, and um, after a few years, I found myself sitting with the same people who designed that standard. And the suffering that I had from extracting information from LMF was actually the motive behind the revision that we did. And I remember one day that we had in China during an ISO meeting, Laurent and I were arguing about if we should leave the standard as it is and um, just trying to make small fixes or we just need to remake a whole revision for the, uh, for the, for the standard and come up with something that is more flexible. And um, um, actually that, the, the keeping in mind, and since I come also from, I have a database, I'm coming from UML modeling world where I'm in my faculty and university. This is something we are proud of using UML, how to model um, lexical information using UML. Um, and I think the reader of, uh, reader of uh, thesis can notice that. Um, so uh, keeping this in mind, this ability to map things to each other, to have something that is more generic. Um, um, for example, um, um, how you can, um, um, for example, map this using this cross references um, 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 objects, classes that we used in, in, uh, in LMF. This is something that helped us actually to come up with this modeling, a flexible modeling that we have in, in Groby dictionaries and that could be actually um, applied um, and give, um, I mean, generate tools for LMF users and the new version, of course, because the old version is, is really too tight and um, very hard to use. So, um, so actually being on the two sides, LMF trying to understand what are the problems and trying to improve this and translate this into the architecture of global dictionaries, that was a um, dynamic. Um, and the second question was about etymology, right? How uh, was about conceptual uh, lacunae in, in LMF uh, beyond etymology. I mean, we know that et etymology is something that uh, was not there. But mm -hmm. did you come across other things which were hard to model in, in LMF? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the revision that we made now for LMF is actually going to be, I mean, extended for, there is like, a, I think, two parts, new parts, semantic, uh, syntactic, syntactic and semantics, and another one for morphology um, uh, extension. These are two things, I mean, here, I think here comes the, 
the the the, 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 the opportunity to actually see how flexible our core model to take into consideration new extensions and um, to be able to um, plug as much as we can on the top of the core model. Um, the first, I mean, the core model and the MRT mo um, extension. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, syntactics and semantics, I think this part is really, really complicated. I mean, to meet actually the lexicographic requirements um, from um, a database extraction point of view, this is something really uh, interesting to see how it's going to be uh, sorted out. And um, yeah, um, we'll see. I mean, the next two years, I think we'll have uh, more answers about um, how we can, how our modeling actually is going to be flexible and how we can take um, more information into account. Wonderful. Uh second part of questions I, I'd have at my heart was, uh, I mean, obviously in the pre-processing of the, uh, the whole system, uh, language dependent components do not play uh, a role. Uh, still, you said that you had tokenization issues with Arabic. <laughs> Could you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? I mean, this is something I would particularly interested in. I mean, if it's language independent, that should not be a problem. Then. Yeah, I mean, this issue is purely technical. Like, um, I don't know. I mean, Patrice, maybe he's, I mean, Patrice, he thought that it was working for Arabic, but I think he was assuming that because he doesn't understand Arabic. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when I had to take like a modern dictionary, modern, not even, not even dictionary, it's like I went on, uh, page of Al Jazeera, the website, and downloaded as a PDF, and then I gave it to the tool to grow it. There was a big issue of uh, tokenization. We even um, authorized the dictionary. We sent it to Lille with Laurent, a big volume, um, and I thought that we were like thirsty to make this work uh, with Grobit dictionaries. But after seeing the internal files and what Grobit could extract from this, it was pretty messy. So. Um, there is, I think, an issue with the library called XPD. I mean, now it's Alto, right, uh, Patrice? It's X, uh, XML to PDF, isn't it? PDF Alto. Now it's called PDF Alto, uh, which is going to extract um, the text from the PDF document and then uh, prepare it as a text to uh, for the, the rest of the pipeline. I think this is where we should look at um, and see what's, what's wrong and um, how we can fix this because I mean, uh, the dictionaries that I have seen and the way how I got here is actually through Arabic dictionaries. So it's a bit uh, pity that I'm not able to actually structure these dictionaries, which were thanks to them, I'm here. So, but that's that's definitely th something that we want to to deal to to sort out and find a, a way how to um, structure because Arabic lexicography is so rich, and it's one of the the languages that are less resourced than compared to German or English or French. So it's definitely something that we need to fix. Yeah, absolutely. And there's lots of stuff out there that could be used. Um, another uh, rather technical question, uh, I'm not sure even if we haven't discussed this before is, why do you proceed from PDF? I mean, I know of course that there are uh, lots and lots, tons of, uh, dictionaries out there in PDF format, but PDF per definitionem is uh, not very text oriented, but rather print oriented. And uh, uh, just hearing that there might be a problem with tokenization, which also might be due to the fact that you're proceeding from PDF and not from, from more text oriented formats. Yes, say something that, about that. Very good point. Actually, um, I mean, when you see, um, most of the dictionaries that we could find now and we could stumble upon were actually in PDF format. It's true that there are um, TXT versions of the, the some dictionaries document, um, the word uh, version, but most of what we have, um, we have in our hands were actually PDF documents. Again, it's a, it's a, it's a technical issue. 
not issue. It's actually just you need some resources to implement this and to be able to support um, other formats. I don't know what's the, I mean, this the, for the case for Grobit, I think this is not an issue because most of the publications, um, scientific papers are in PDF formats. Um, you can have them in LaTeX format, for example, but this is, I mean, um, less, I think, um, I mean, um, something missing. I mean, so mostly PDF is enough for a dictionary, for, uh, sorry, for scientific papers. But it's true for dictionaries, we need to find a way how quickly implement something for other formats to be able to structure them. Conservative but, in this respect. I'd, I'd prefer LaTeX <laughs> if I had the chance to. Yeah, but the question then, the question then is if we have it in another format, how much um, physical clues we can extract from these formats? Because as you have, as you have seen, like half of our um, features that you are using are based on physical um, aspects of the document. And when you have uh, something like, I, I, I remember the um, uh, TXT version of an Arabic dictionaries that we worked on years ago. It was like, I think, uh, manually um, taped, um, I, I think you will lose a lot of um, physical clues and typography clues. That's yeah, of uh, course, yeah. All the formatting and stuff, uh, which but, is so essential for Grobit, yeah. Mm. But it could much cleaner than a PDF because working with PDF is a nightmare. Um, and I've seen a lot of problems with dealing with PDF. That's something for sure. Yeah which has made me quite sad to see over the past couple of years that uh, OCR packages these days usually only <laughs> produce PDF output and only professional versions sometimes uh, give you an XML source or something uh, more reusable. Yeah, uh, to wrap up maybe finally, uh, the term infrastructure has uh, already been been mentioned and as I you know I'm a very infrastructure minded person and therefore very practically minded uh, I, I remember having been in one of the workshops Laurent I think in Berlin this was this was also one of these uh, last year uh, workshops where we transformed dictionaries or was it something else the anyway, I talked to, class yeah yeah I, I talked to people who were experimenting with with grow bit for uh, lexicographic purposes i mean if i come these days with a reasonably formatted pdf dictionary in a latin based alphabet uh, how much time would i have uh, to invest to get something reusable are we talking about hours days weeks what, what would be your, just your experience? Of course, that's not really objectifiable. Well, depending, depending on the complexity of the dictionary first and depending on how much um, information you want to, to extract from that dictionary. So for example, I was, I managed, so the Mishtek, Mishtek dictionary that you have seen earlier, um, the one with simple entries, I don't know if uh, I can quickly Go to that slide so you can at least have an idea about how it works. Um, here it is. I don't know if I could make it. So this dictionary, the one, this nice one with small entries. Oops, you see it? Yeah, yeah. So that one, actually, I managed to structure it within two hours. Mm. But I'm well trained. So if someone needs to use it, um, he probably needs to attend one Groby Dictionaries workshop. And then probably like in the day after, I mean, this is actually what happened in Berlin, the masterclass in Berlin that people like we trained them one day, they spend the, the night trying to annotate and the day after they come up with the structured version. This is something really impressive that we had. Um, so it could take you two hours after attending a workshop um, but if you see this nice dictionary here, let me just, I, because earlier I was kind of, um, I didn't have time to do this. But Is that Jack's dictionary? And Le Litre, for example. If you see here the text, 
Yeah. Um, the 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 Emily Tre goes on and on. It's like 27 or 28 senses, and still the, the description goes on and on. So that dictionary could take you. I don't know. If you first, you need first to understand the the, the the dictionary, how the information is organized, and this could take a lot of time if you are new to the dictionary. But if you already you are familiar with different parts of the dictionary, because you, you know, I mean, a dictionary could take like five, seven years, 20 years to be compiled. So in between, the lexicographer could change them his mind the way how he is modeling his entries. So if you are aware of all these um, diverse schemes that he used in the dictionary, let's say um, a dictionary like um, Litre, you could spend maybe one week, 10 days, and then you can get it structured. So. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that, that that could kill many jobs for many people. I'm sorry for that, but um, could help also creating new jobs for people who are going to extract that information. And uh, although yeah. I'm not even sure, uh, I mean, uh, language change has been accelerating, and uh, us digitizing historical data, and I guess most of these things we have been seeing here are historical data would not necessarily uh, kick uh, the lexicographers that are still around out out of business i'm sure about that yeah oh, 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 wonderful uh, actually i'm I, I do not want to repeat anything that has already been mentioned i'm very uh, optimistic uh, about the future of grobit i wish you all the best Thank for you. the future uh, and also for quite selfish reasons because <laughs> I've been hoping and working towards freely accessible lexical data for many years now and when you see how much is out there in in this kind of data even for languages such as English or German or French uh, I guess we all see there is still a lot to be done and uh, we are only at the beginning so all the best and good luck in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. So now uh, that's the Laurent, uh, the director of the thesis, uh, who can ask questions. Uh, yeah, I'm not supposed to ask questions, I would say, because we've discussed a lot, obviously, with Mohammed. Um, I'm trying to be sh brief at the same time, got a lot of things to say. Um, the, the main thing is basically that this thesis has been a kind of a adventure um, where I feel like a, a companion to, to, to Mohammed's work. Um, this adventure, you may not see it, is reflected, of course, in this jury where a lot of people for various reasons have been at the interface between Mohammed's work and several domains of interest. And we've been discussing things with quite a few people around this table uh, on how to model dictionaries, on how to, to extract information from the dictionary. And um, I think this adventure, uh, I wanted to add something because there may be people present whom we, not, we do not see if uh, the, the defense is live stream and namely the colleagues from Sfax where Mohammed is coming from because um, I attended Bilal Gagori's uh, jury in 2002 a long time ago and that was my first connection with this community of, uh, of colleagues who had a real interest in lexical data in, in computer science uh, modeling and implementing and I think this uh, creuse as we would say in French uh, explains where um, uh, uh, Mohammed is coming from. So um, a little hello to the colleagues uh, in Sfax if they, they hear us. Um, this has also been um, uh, a scientific adventure with Patrice, of course, Patrice Lopez. Uh, 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 so I've, I've looked at my mail and I see in October 2008, someone telling me, j'ai commencé à faire un truc qui extrait et analyse header et référence d'articles en PDF. Uh, and um, following a, a series of, uh, of meals we had, we used to have lunch together and think about fancy things to do. And uh, overnight, Patrice came with the first version of Grobin and it had started quite a few joint activities over the years. And, and Mohammed's is not the least of those uh, results, I think. So um, 
in a way we can be, be proud of this. Um, the idea of um, passing dictionary has been around for quite some time. I remember discussing even with Thoma um, a long time ago about enriching dictionaries. We had those ideas there. So it was like uh, a dream. And also with Patricia, remember we had this opportunity to work on a Slavonic dictionary, but it would have been too complex at that time. Um, I guess you remember this. And so when, when Mohammed came and said, oh, I would like to, to work in the continuity of what I've been doing so far with LMF and a few things and, and, and do a PhD accordingly, um, it was like a dream to, to we say in French, uh, lever le verrou, so to unlock this, this very difficult issue of parsing a dictionary completely uh, out of the blue somehow. And I, I must say, I'm very impressed by the results at the end of the day, Mohammed. Um, I would not have expected that we could really take those kinds of simple dictionaries and completely pass them with a very high accuracy as we have. So it was a very good orientation at the beginning, but also a very uh, difficult work to, to carry it until the end. And in this respect, it has really been um, 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 a human uh, adventure uh, as much as a scientific adventure. I guess you've understood that through the training sessions we, we did all together and we sent all people around this with table with the various workshops, uh, with the technical uh, sessions we had to decide on LMF, on TILX0 with Toma where we would hardly immediately agree on anything uh, right from the beginning. So this has also been very, very interesting. And among the things, I guess it was between the lines, is that each time we had to deal with Grobit dictionary issues, you need to imagine that the users are people coming with their dictionary, their little thing. Uh, so you don't find immediately tens of annotators. Um, who was that who spoke about in? annotator agreement. Uh, yeah, Patrice. It's impossible. You don't have that so many annotators at hand because when someone comes with a, a PDF, he is really willing to work on it, but no one else is interested in Fang French dictionary, for instance. Um, so there's one user. And that's why at the end of the day, when Mohammed started this huge endeavor of, of making tests and comparisons and, and benchmark, uh, basically, you ended up annotating yourself most of the, the, the data you needed. So this is something we need to, to see how to improve. One would say, okay, let's use crowdsourcing, what have you. But everything is complex to, it's really infrastructural uh, to, to deploy something at the level of uh, reaching out to a community of, of users. Um, um, you said, Mohammed, some people may lose their job. So I want to tell a little anecdote. Um, the first time we presented the uh, Grobit Dictionary that was in Leiden in 2017 at the ELEX conference, and we were presenting on the Thursday, but on the Wednesday, we attended a paper by uh, Vinman and Buchanan about the Orkney Dictionary. And these were people working basically for a consultancy company, and they had been working for two years and quite some money to actually uh, retroconvert by means of regular expressions and things like this, a, a dictionary which was available in Word initially. And so at the end of the presentation, we said, oh, we're starting something. Could you give us a PDF? And I remember that we were sitting in the lounge of the hotel um, and within one or two hours, we had a first attempt. And basically we could reach with um, grow bit dictionary, the level of quality of those people after two years of manual work. So that was, this is a real breakthrough as one would say in, uh, in political science. So um, this, I mean, I keep having this in mind. Uh, um, and they didn't uh, answer consider the work, yeah. And they didn't answer to your email when you sent them the structured version. Yeah, they never <laughs> answered when I, I, I sent the TI version. Um, so I, at the end of the day, uh, to conclude, I think, yeah, we've, we've gone beyond our expectations, but at the same time, we, I think as a group here, from what I hear, we would like to have the big black box where we put a dictionary in the entry and have the full TI. 
my intuition is that we're very far from it. Um, uh, there's still a lot of work to have a journal, I would say, document parser, uh, understanding, learning and understanding uh, the structure, like Mohammed said, because we'll be lacking data. So there are some powerful deep learning models, but you need some powerful data to, to feed in. Um, and also it will only work if you've got an interest from users because you'll only get data and results if you've got someone coming to you and say, I would like to have, like Simon, you would like to have um, 18th, 17th century uh, drama being passed automatically so that he would have a TI version, for instance. So that's the kind of thing. So I would like to, to thank you, Mohammed, very much for all the, the work you've carried out and the uh, the pleasure to see those blooming results here and there, and the jury at large for their presence and support, not only today, but all over the years uh, uh, in this endeavor. And I've got no question, Benoit. Okay, but you could. Uh, thank you, Laurent. Uh, so that's my turn. Uh, so I am uh, the president of the committee, so my role is uh, mostly administrative. However, I've read your thesis and I have some questions for you anyway. Um, and uh, first of all, what I would like to tell you about your thesis is really it's uh, very clear and well structured as other people have said, that's uh, very remarkable. And I found it very uh, easy, uh, not, uh, I mean, uh, enjoyable to read. I mean, it was a nice lecture. Uh, so I think other people have said it and it's something which is really striking when, when we, we have the thesis. Um, also, uh, I think it's an important work uh, for many reasons, but I will ask you questions about it. And I would, we, I would like to, to, to figure out what are your motivation, in fact, uh, why you, you think yourself it's important. Uh, but first, uh, I would like to ask you a, a, a little question, uh, a little gory question, in fact. Uh, in fact, I, I'm interested in deep learning models, and I've been quite surprised that uh, the CRF does better than a deep learning model. Uh, uh, and you, uh, you said that it was largely because of the lack of data. Uh, you, you expect that with more data, it would work better. Uh, but on the other hand, we, my experience says that with small data, I can uh, smash the CRF uh, with a deep learning model. Uh, and the question is, um, uh, what is the, what's inside your model? You, you cite LAMPL, uh, uh, it's an uh, uh, LSTM CRF model, uh, but did you try, uh, let's say, simpler models? And in fact, when I read your thesis, it was calling for um, actual uh, deep learning models, uh, uh, for instance, uh, deep learning models using character models uh, because it helps to somehow uh, handle the, the OCR errors and the noise in your data. Uh, you could use fast text embeddings who are also designed to handle these orthographic problems. Uh, and even, uh, let's say, uh, BERT or uh, similar, uh, very large models. Uh, did you try any of these? Uh, uh, is it applicable to your problem? Maybe I, I just don't uh, have a, a good idea enough of the, 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 how your input looks like, mm -hmm. uh, but I would be interested to have your opinion about all that. Yeah, sure. Um, so actually the, the, the point of that experiment is actually to say that now we are able to work with CRFs and um, we can extend this work to work with deep learning. And again, thanks to Patrice, who made a wonderful job by making um, switching between deep learning models and classic machine learning models really easy, like the same data that you have. You just need to change one line instead of Wapiti, you change, you put Delft, and that's the thing that all that you need to do to activate the deep learning to, to, to run the training. Now, when, when it comes to the, the, the model that we have used and you were skepti skeptical about how, if actually classic machine learning is going, can beat actually what we have now as BERT and many sophisticated, more advanced. Um, I totally agree with you that the experiment is not, that was not the point to say that, um, that actually CRFs are much better. Um, as we have used an implementation um, that Patrice did from a, a model from 2016. So from 2016 to 2020, there has been a lot that has been achieved. 
And with Camembert, uh, for example, that uh, we have shown that even with a small amount of data, um, like four giga, I think, um, we are able um, to have something that is really powerful. So um, we can actually uh, give that a try and see what other models, new models, what, what they could do. And um, I, I, I'm looking forward to that. Actually, it's something interesting that I really want to see. So I don't know if I answered the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it clarifies. So that's good, good. Thank you. And then the second question is much more uh, abstract. Uh, there, I must say that I'm don't I much, much I'm not really into the this uh, computational or this lexicograph lexico lexicographical community. Mm -hmm. uh, so I might be a, a bit naive, but. Um, one of the questions that I have in mind is what kind of uh, use you can imagine. So you, 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 you get your dictionary, so that's really something new for the, the community. And, and so uh, what kind of topics in, let's say, computational lexicography could you imagine that will emerge with your, uh, the, your new digitized uh, dictionaries? For instance, I was uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, could you, with your dictionaries, uh, get some uh, synonymy networks uh, that you could compare from dictionary to dictionary or from time to time or from language to language? Uh, could you, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, for instance, could you uh, uh, imagine that you could somehow do some comp computational etymology to compare how the dictionaries are uh, uh, defining etymology? Uh, and I mean, I'm really naive here, and I would be interested if you could point me out some of the possible potential application, uh, or to tell me if at least those two uh, applications that I had in mind are, would be possible. What would be the interest of, uh, you said that you would like to add a name identity, in name identity recognition. Uh, what kind of application would, would, would it allow to do? Uh, so can you please? Uh, Give me some light there. Thank you. Yeah, sure. um, yeah actually, th this is something that I thought in the beginning of my thesis that I would be able to do is actually I'm using what I generate as structured dictionaries. So um, within the LXS project, um, there is this big dream of having um, dictionary metrics where you connect all the dictionaries from different um, um, inputs and different um, um, categories. Um, I totally agree that the next step that would be actually to connect everything that we generated from these print dictionaries to come up with kind of network where you can allow etymology studies, um, even even um, like what sense does this ambiguation enriching what exists, um, connecting, for example, if you find the mention of um, a named entity within an entry, we could connect it to another data dictionary or to Wikidata or Wiktionary, for example. So there is a plenty of things that we could do with a structured lexical database for well-resourced languages and for the endangered ones where we still have like just few materials. Um, so I, I think like the step that comes or maybe the step that in the, in the pipeline that is um, probably now, now it's right the right time to think about it is actually how to plug in such um, modules where you are going to make uh, make actually use of these entries and uh, that we are structured from dictionaries and link them together. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think I, I'm done with, with the questions. Uh, and so uh, I think it's time for the, the jury to uh, move to the, the, the other room. So we thank you again for, for your, your, your presentation and your questions. Uh, so the I, I have a question for Laurence. So we are supposed to come back to this main room once we are done with the the absolutely the, yeah. So we will and get back it's, to you in, yeah yeah. It's not a problem because uh, Mohammed is the master of this room and I'm the one for the other room. So if you quit quit this uh, this session and go to the other session, we'll meet uh, and, and leave Mohammed here. alone. Don't move. Yeah, don't move. Oh, wait, 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 wait. How do we go to the other room? You look at my mail where I send two okay, links. Okay. We'll do. And the first one is this one. The second one is the other one. I like reference. 
So see you. Okay, we see, see you. you. See you. Oui. Mala bik. Mazid. Bele. Talu zalik ghair. Mazid mshi wa tawi yamal deliberation tawi. Ha khadar 
Oui, 20 secondes. Ouais. Allez, à tout, à tout moment, les yeux, t'as été Ciao.
Il fallait qu'il nous laisse rentrer, en fait. On arrive tous. Oui. Ah, on n'a pas notre président. Should I say something or? Une seconde, je termine de prendre mes notes. Ah euh, Pardon. C'est bon. Donc, on va par contre faire cette partie-ci en français. Je pense que c'est obligatoire. Il y a des formules à donner. Euh, donc, voilà. Donc, euh, donc cher Mohamed, hein, euh, le jury, donc, après avoir délibéré, euh, a décidé donc, de te décerner le diplôme de docteur en informatique de l'Université de Paris. Euh, et donc, le jury euh, veut mentionner les points suivants. Euh, C'est que nous avons donc particulièrement apprécié euh, euh, le fait que ta, ta thèse et ta présentation soient euh, particulièrement bien structurées, bien écrites et agréables à lire. Euh, donc, on pense que ta thèse va avoir un certain impact hein, et qui est déjà visible, notamment euh, à travers les publications euh, que tu as déjà réalisées. Alors, le jury a également apprécié euh, que la thèse reflète un haut degré d'interdisciplinarité, de, euh, notamment euh, il y a quand même tout un aspect lexicographique et informatique et que ta thèse a été perçue positivement par les deux communautés, euh, ce qui n'est quand même pas rien. Euh, alors, le jury a également euh, tenu à commenter euh, la conception de ton travail. Hein. Donc, on pense que, euh, a, on apprécie que ton travail... Hein, repose sur des bases théoriques hein, bien réfléchies et apparemment solides et euh, que tu utilises des méthodes qui ont été visiblement bien pensées. Euh, on remarque également que ta bibliographie semble bien à jour et que tu es arrivé avec tout ça à produire un système qui est vraiment opérationnel, hein, donc ce qui n'est pas complètement banal. Hein, comme, euh, voilà. Ensuite, euh, on pense que ta thèse va avoir une certaine importance, euh, notamment pour euh, la modélisation de dictionnaires plus anciens, euh, et ce qui va donc euh, en fait avoir un impact hein, euh, important pour euh, la euh, recherche en lexicographie historique. C'est également important pour vis-à-vis euh, -vis des standards, notamment tu as un lien entre, euh, disons, des aspects, des aspects machine learning qui sont liés vers la production de données standardisées, donc ce qui n'est pas courant. Euh, on a aussi remarqué que tu as déjà une, une expertise qui est reconnue euh, dans ton domaine et notamment au travers des institutions avec lesquelles hein, tu travailles. Euh, alors, on veut également euh, souligner que pour la défense, la soutenance, euh, nous avons eu donc une, une, une discussion relativement longue et intéressante sur un nombre de, 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 de sujets variés euh, et ce qui reflète en fait les, une quantité importante de, 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 de capacités que tu as dû acquérir pour mener à bien ton travail de thèse. Euh, les réponses que tu nous as données euh, nous euh, suggèrent que tu as appris une distance, une hauteur par rapport à ton sujet qui est tout à fait appréciable. Euh, 
dans l'ensemble, donc nous avons trouvé que tu as répondu avec maturité aux questions. Et voilà, et donc pour finir, nous pouvons donc te féliciter euh, pour euh, l'obtention de ta thèse. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Bravo. Bon, voilà, on peut applaudir. C'est le côté visio, vous voyez. <rire> Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Ça... Ah, en anglais, uh, Thomas, uh, that was an honor. Thank you all for accepting being there um, this special day and this chapter that is, I'm closing in my career and my life. Merci beaucoup. Obrigada. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, co and congratulations um, from all of us. I'm, I'm really glad that I was always singled out as the stupid foreigner who doesn't understand French. <laughs> This one, but, uh, but, but you're I used have, to it, Thomas, with me. I'm so used. I mean, <laughs> let's not go there. But anyway, congratulations once again. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Thank you. So it's, it's pleasure, very weird, Mama. so no one is um, asking you to join for a drink, but let's hope we'll have an opportunity, at least some of us, to yeah, share definitely. something sometimes. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. Yes. So thank Please you again. As, as, yeah, and Please stay safe until we have a drink and bye. We will. We'll celebrate. Bye bye. See you soon. Bye. See thank you soon. Bye bye. You bye bye. bye, -bye. Benoît, tu as besoin de quelque chose en direct ou pas, ou tout va bien, toi Je pense. Hein, écoute, j'ai l'impression que tout est bon. D'accord. Eh bien, okay. au revoir alors. Au revoir. Au revoir, au revoir. À très bientôt. Bye bye. 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 bye.